I played guitar so fucking much, man, you know, and just weird shit just kept happening. And as long as you're like paying attention, you know, and you can find something, you know, a lot of times you make a weird mistake or sometimes I, I, one of the, one of the things I suggest for my guitar students, if you're trying to come up with something different, pretend you're having a seizure on the guitar, you know, just start like freaking <laughs> out. It'll be, it'll That's be nonsensical. Awesome. <laughs> but like if you're paying if you're paying attention, it's like you're fishing, you know, you're fishing in the okay. in like the rapids, you know, the rapids and somehow you pull out. Oh, my God. What if I go, you know, like you're, all of a sudden you're doing something neat. Welcome to the 32nd episode of the Cassette Ends Creation. I'm your host, Chris Deering. This is a show where I interview bands and public figures from the Mathcore community. If you beautiful people in chat have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in. I'll try to read them aloud. Uh, if you'd like to sub, you get, you get access to some exclusive emotes as well as early access to interviews before they hit the streaming services and YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, listening to this in your car, and have no idea what I'm talking about, the show is first recorded live on Twitch. Join us every Sunday and Wednesday for the live cast at twitch.tv slash the Cassidens creation on another note vinyl for memes dreams and flying machines finally came in after like almost a seven month wait so uh yeah all orders have shipped uh and look at that sick ass vinyl my man awesome uh with that out of the way let me introduce our guest tonight who's a freaking legend freaking chris arp of psyopus how's it going my man hi i'm going good how are you doing <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> no, I'm doing right. great, man. I'm doing great, man. Uh, let me just start off by saying that your playing has greatly influenced me. Like, I don't look at the guitar the same now after I've seen you do your playthroughs as you post it up. It, it's amazing. Like, uh, I love how the one that I love the most, the, the move that you do that I love the most is when you flick the uh, whammy bar and tap at the same time and make that kind of buzzing sound. That blew my mind the first time oh, I yeah, saw yeah. it. I was just like, holy shit, you can do this? Like, it's absolutely <laughs> amazing. I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that I wouldn't be doing the kind of music I'm doing if it wasn't for you. Like, it's it's absolutely right, amazing, man. Like, it changed my life. It changed my life. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It makes me feel good. <laughs> so I know there's two questions we're going to be completely swamped with, so might as well just get them out of the way now. First one, are we ever going to get vinyl? Um... I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> like, well, <laughs> what, 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 what happens often is we'll have these like, um, you know, I think the last album came out in 2009. So it's been like, you know, over what do the math, <laughs> 11, 12 years. Uh, it was in February, so it's coming up on 12 years. So since then, it, it, periodically, someone will check in with, with us and be like, hey, we want to release something on vinyl. And uh, I'm just like so out of the loop with what the hell's going on. So I'm like, all right, you know, like either like I'll just like, not ignore it on purpose, but I just like there's so much shit going on that I'm like, I don't even know where to go. Or I would say like um, probably guy, you know, with black market activities would probably be the person to talk to about that. Uh, but yeah, man, I like I think the whoever would be making those decisions are not me <laughs> you know like i'd probably be working more on like trying to put out more material or something if someone wants to do it i hope they do it it'll be cool you know usually whenever they're anyone's talking about like releasing vinyl they'll be like we want to press like 500 and we'll give you like 50 or something and probably only need like three <laughs> but like it would be cool to have them on vinyl you know so yeah uh, so yeah. it's not an issue that like the label owns it or something and they're not willing to do it it's just it, I, it might happened. It might. I mean, I know Guy probably, especially at this point. I I haven't. I get, my my pulse isn't so much on what the scene is, um, but it's been my impression. You know, Guy's pretty much doing his his thing. I don't know how much of a BMA is like, you know, how how caught up in the peripheral of his life it is that label. Um, Guy would probably be more than cool with it. As far as Metal Blade goes, um, you know, I I I doubt it is impossible, but you know, they're kind of. Uh, a little more at upper echelon, you know, I don't know how much it would be worth someone's time and efforts to do it. You know, I, if anything, I mean, if someone wanted to, to do it just for the sole purpose of doing it and making no money on it or possibly even losing money on it, I'm sure my hope would be more than happy. Oh, to they would make money. Yeah. They would definitely make money, man. I do. That's the number one question I've been getting is like, yeah. when are we going to be getting vinyl? And if not, like what's stopping it from happening? So, uh, right. there's definitely a market yeah. for it out there. 
Yeah, I guess uh, someone someone with enough ambition to find out the answer <laughs> could probably do that. I, apparently, I don't have enough ambition or focus to do it. I mean, I, it would be cool. I just, again, as I'm sure we go through this, like the interview process, I'm so scatterbrained. Who, you know, I, I don't know what the fuck's going on. So, <laughs> <All whatever. righty>. <laughs> <laughs> So the second one is, uh, we. I've been told to grind you into oblivion over new Psyopus material questions. And that was literally one of the comments. Okay. I'm not going to grind right. you into oblivion, but uh, we yeah. have heard rumors over the years of uh, various times of Psyopus reuniting. Metal Injection posted an article one time about it. Um, mm. are, is this any? Tr are there any truth to this? Are there plans to bring Psyopus back? Um, yeah, like we were. Um, so I had moved to Binghamton, New York, which is about a long two and a half hours from Rochester. And I had, I had lived there for like six and a half years and there was no way Psyopus would be rekindled at all while I was down there because I was the only person in Psyopus there. Um, but I had, when I, when I moved back, I um, connected with Fred and Adam who were from the original lineup, the bass player and the vocalist, and we wanted to get it going. And uh, within a very short time of just, talking you know just like social intercourse we ended up um finding a brutal sick uh death metal drummer named dan and he started learning the tunes and uh you know it's just been slow coming because uh just life's complicated we haven't been able to get together more than once a week um this COVID thing really was a hoof to the balls for everyone you know like i think like the the first the first wave that came through we were prudent and then we started talking about getting back together and then everyone is at least in you know everyone i know in in monroe county in, in the rochester area has just totally gone on lockdown no one's fucking around especially because uh fred and adam they have children they have families and everything and so we'll see um it's the the <clears throat> like if i'm just being 100 percent honest it's uh the amount of time and energy it costs to produce a set list that everyone can play, especially when we haven't done it in so long, is um, is pretty demanding uh, as far as you know my adult life goes and trying to find space amongst amongst my true ambitions right now and that. And like when Psyopus was happening, I was able to put 110% into it, you know, and something we laugh, around, uh, we laugh about when we're at the rehearsal space, I'll be like, you know, when I was writing this material, I never like spent the time to consider that I might want to try to relearn it all in my mid forties, you know, cause like so much of it is just like, was when I was, you know, technical proficiency is certainly an ingredient in the, the Psyopus catalog. So, like, you know, not playing it for a long time. I mean, there's some shit that I, I just don't even remember what the fuck's going on. Like, I, you know, I don't, and like, I don't want to sit there and try to figure the notes out again. There's just so many fucking notes. Dude, I'm know? like that like, with my music that I just put out like a couple months ago. Like, I, I already forgot yeah. how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Like, I, I, um, I think now that I'm in Rochester and we have the group together, it, there, it would be a tragedy if we didn't at least get together to put some shows together. I mean, I have tons of riffs. I, um, some other cool opportunities had happened between now and, you know, since Psyopus went on hiatus like 12 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever, um, that I, I do have like, you know, 60 or 70 riffs. Um, yes, Psyopus writes riffs too, but I, I have like a bunch of these riffs that I could do something with. Um, I've got tons of, like, Right now, I'm sure we'll get to it, like what my musical ambitions are at the time, but I am just like balls deep in like music theory and um, it, it, music theory as a very broad blanket statement. So, you know, as I'm going through and all these like abstract ideas that come to my head, you know, I do have, I do have a, uh, you know, a, a, a composition notebook that says this is fucking metal and everything that I put in it is like Psyopus related. It's a, it's just, um, I remember Elton John once said something like when you have those inspiring ideas, you have to you have to pounce on it then because if you put it aside, you know, when you decide to go back to it, if you even do, you're 
whole, your consciousness is going to be in a completely different spot. And I'm somewhat um, concerned about that, you know, especially because I don't think about Psyopis so much. And when Psyopis was happening, it's all I thought about. So I was, it was very easy for me to, um, to access information and ideas that I had filed away in my brain, you know, on how I was going to do this, what I was going to do that. What's, you know, you know, I could just sit here and brainstorm uh, all the options. Um, but since Psyopis is not, you know, in the, my main priority right now, it's sometimes hard for me to feel like I'm actually going to make the most of these like random ideas I stumble upon. We'll see. We'll see. You know, we'll see. That's a, that's a, that's a very assertive, we will see. <laughs> Or we'll lose our sight. I don't know, whatever. Well, it feels uh, like this might be happening, might actually be happening the way you're talking about it. Like, I feel pretty good about that. So, like, you you would like to get back there, get back out there at least. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue is this. Like, there's, like, three, like, three key projects I could be working on now, excluding a couple other, like, sub-projects. And they all would take... Um, a hundred percent focus and what a hundred percent focus means is like all of your focus, you know? So I, that's and typically what a hundred percent of your focus means. Yes. Generally speaking, <laughs> you know, unless you're in an argument with someone who has no idea what a hundred percent means, but, uh, um, so like I, you know, I have to, the, the, the there's a certain level of integrity and expression I need to, um, maintain to feel like I am being appropriate. Like, you know, I'm like doing what I, what I mean to do, um, acting based off of my values, um, as an artist. And if it, I, I just won't be able to put any material out if I'm like spreading myself thin, you know, like, again, like there was just so many ideas in the Psyopis stuff. And then they were constantly like, you know, like one of my, one of my, um, my biggest regrets of the Psyopis era is that how rushed I was on odd senses, you know, like my, my big thing as we were signing the metal blade contract, the only thing I gave a fuck about was like not having any deadlines for when we put an album out. And, um, before odd senses came out, Mike Failey, the president of metal blade, like called me like a couple of times. So like, can we get an album out by this time? And if you do, we'll have this out, we'll have that out. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's try. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I unfortunately had to rush too many things. I mean, I had going into it, I had a lot of ideas just from being in Psyopis for so long, you know, it's like, I was always like, there's always shit to work on, but, um, I didn't get to address the, you know, the, the nuances and the, 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 the sculpting or, you know, like, um, sanding off the corners or whatever, which I would have preferred doing. Like I was just telling, um, a buddy, I was like, if we were to go back into the studio, I would re, -re I like, even if we're going in for the fourth album, I don't give a fuck. We're re-recording a burning halo, but the burning halo and completely changing the drums. 180%. Jason, the drummer on, on that album, it wasn't his drums for that song. So it's nothing on him. It was actually like, just like formulaically shit I put together because I was under such a crunch. And now when I listen to it, it's like, it makes no fucking sense. It's fucking stupid. You know, it's just <laughs> dumb. And I don't give a fuck. Like it's the same label. It's a fucking this band. If I want to fucking re-record it with completely different drums, whatever, it's a remix. Eat shit, you know? <laughs> I think it sounds good, man. So you write the drums and do you do like the lyrics and stuff too for Psyopus? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, um, dense creative commitment. I, um, like on the first album, uh, Adam and Greg wrote about half of them. I wrote about the other half. And then for the most part on our puzzling encounters, I wrote the lyrics. There were a few occasions like Hormi Liar where, Adam and John the Brutal, the drummer from that album, were like hanging out at Adam's house and, you know, we're just like trying to put shit together and, and stuff. Um, and then just in case, in case in point of what I was just talking about with the rushing, um, the r rushing the material to be in the studio. So a lot of times I'll like 
I could, you know, take a month writing lyrics. I could take longer than that. And then, and even after they're like, you know, 85% done, I might still say, you know, that one line just doesn't flow right. I, you know, and then you change it and you're like, thank God, you know, I came up with that new idea three months later. Um, but when we were in the studio for uh, Odd Senses, what would happen is I would wake up at three in the morning and start chugging Red Bulls and write the <laughs> lyrics for write the lyrics for the song we're going to do that day. Um, Brian would pick me up at whatever, 7 or 8 p.m. or a.m. And we would take the hour and 45 minute drive to Lockport where Watchman Studios is, where we record the albums. And we would be in there and the music would be there. We would work on that one song all day and be like, all right, you know, Brian, this is how this part goes. And let's try this. And hey, Doug, try it like this rhythm. Yeah. All right. Move that a little over, you know, like shit like that. It'll be done. Go home, pass out, wake up the next day, start chugging Red Bull, start writing on the lyrics Jeez. for the next song. Oh, it fucking sucked, man. It really did. Like, whatever. I, but, it, you know, I sure yeah, I'd like the lyrics to be clever, but let's let's keep it real. Like half the time, you don't know what anyone's fucking saying in these like screaming <laughs> death metal boys. Right. Yeah. But the, the, the thing I'm more concerned about is like the 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 rhythmic mo melody, you know, like how, how would it get delivered and. I always thought no, you just did the guitar. I didn't know that you also did like the lyrics and the drums and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fucking work, man. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was obsessed with it. You know, I was um, undiagnosed bipolar. So I was just like, I had a 130% energy and 110% uh, focus. And uh, it, it was it, like, I, part of having manic upswings when you're bipolar is you have these grandiose ideas of what's going on, or at least you, so like, it, you know, it might've been a cool idea, you know, obviously you were a fan of the band, so something was cool. Right. But like, I might've thought it was really cool, you know? And it, cause like, it's kind of, it's like kind of a part of like the, the manic upswing, you know, you just, and the advantage to that is it's enough, like, delusional fuel to keep you motivated you know like when it's like you know people are telling you you're a fucking loser <laughs> i don't know, you know. <laughs> I, I had so many people tell me like you know that i should not try to be in a band or whatever you know and i was always like really you. yeah i mean what you know whatever it's life you know people are like that so mm. i mean my father my my I, I love my father but he's cuckoo bananas like <laughs> we're like it's like our we're like I remember it was like our second album maybe is coming out and everything's going really well. We're peaking pretty good. And my father was still trying to convince me to go work at like, a, a, you know, we're in all the magazines are getting great reviews. Like it was, it was like probably the peak moment for the band. And my father's still trying to get me to work in a factory. So he's bringing, bringing like applications. Like it was my birthday. He brought a bunch of applications for a couple different factory jobs. He's like, like, no dad, I'm not going back to the plastic factory. I'm going right. to the Playboy no. mansion. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that plastic factory. Yeah. That was, I'm not, I'm not built. For, that's the, that's the, the worst part of it like say for some reason i had to buy into the narrative that the music thing is just so unpractical the right decision is to like buckle down and get a more traditional job if i were to do that factory work would not be it i'm like i'm an a-type personality man like i'm not a fucking you know i'm not a gear in the machine you know but whatever you know my dad if he doesn't know me by now he'll never ever know me now he eventually i think he, he came to terms with uh Psyopis being my thing after the band stopped touring so, whatever. <laughs> no he's like whatever happened to that band like you need to you, know, <laughs> yeah. you need to get out there again. you seemed really you seemed really into it i don't get it uh so we have a question um from I never know how to say his name. I guess it's Guitar Costas, maybe? Uh, he's actually from yeah. the band Sensor Ace. I don't know if you heard them. They released a sick album last year. Wait, what are they called? Sensor Age? Sensor Ace. Oh, like I erasing no your senses. Oh, uh, cool name. <laughs> That's a sick name, right? Uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. he asks, how easy is it for the singer to get into the music when you compose the songs? I mean, rhythmically and in their morphology. Um, so is it hard to like easy? get them to like figure out what to do in the songs? So hard to teach that no uh there i mean there's a you know there's a a number of different methodologies we used um for one once we've worked together a few times you know there's going to be this 
at least a formulaic way of communicating with each other. Um, one thing that I remember we would do is like we would record the song at the rehearsal space on our little like tape deck. And um, I might bring it home and put it like on a four track or something and just speak out the words with the phrasing. OK, you yeah. know, yeah, obviously it wasn't delivered the appropriate with the appropriate expression. And then Adam, I think he was painting at the time. He would go and just listen to it over and over and over again while he's painting, you know. And uh, dude, I want to hear those yeah. tracks. Actually, I think that'd be really interesting hearing you just like speaking the words. Right, <laughs> <It'd> be wild. <laughs> like all this crazy oh shit's happening. You're just there, like talking normally. I'm, cro- <laughs> I, I'm like I'm crooning over it. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I can't think of the lyrics for a single fucking song right now. But yeah. So that would happen. Obviously, we would be in the studio. Um, you know, you could do certain tweaking here and there. I think, I think that last methodology we were talking about was probably the most common because I don't, I don't particularly remember outside of you know working on "Poor Meat Liar" as far as lyrics go. Yeah, I don't know. It's so it's uh, not that as, as challenging as you would think. You were a lot of talk- Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's right. I, I think a lot of the Psyopis, like the whole facade is kind of like hype. It's not actually as complicated as like people would think, you know, once it gets, you know, it's just like if something gets explained to you, obvi- obviously we went a little over the over the top with some of the stuff where it's it's a little dense to get the first or second time around. So if like your grandmother or your seeing girlfriend doesn't give a fuck about it, it's not hard to understand. But, you know, if you, the idea is if you listen to it a few times and you get used to the uh, the contours and what the song has to offer, you can grasp it. But that being said, if 99% of the shit, it, it, it just you have to be all you need to you, know, you need some form of technical facility, but you need just patience, you know, just like patience to just incrementally learn, you know, little things. But it's not really that it's not really too much quantum physics so so uh i remember you talking about in a couple of interviews that you've got i, I don't remember how you how you said it you had like uh, a project you were working on uh it's like some mm-hmm. kind of latin jazz thing coffee shop thing uh what, <laughs> yeah. what's going well, on with that um so yeah that seems to be my my number one um focus right now uh i i I could just tell you there's just so many influences like right now it um it's a very there's so many i I, it's hard to describe like i could tell you like uh different influences i have that i'm like pulling in information from right now i'm like i have the coolest eclectic music book like collection ever right and i've been studying so intensely like one of my key focuses right now is just um expression like really trying to um find out every angle i can take on expression what you know all the different types of dynamics um psychological components um you know and dynamics again is just like any sense of diversity uh you know just a brainstorm thing like uh you know techniques you might use like are you gonna sweet pick are you gonna use a dyad are you gonna like trill how are you going to manipulate all those concepts is it going to be fast is it going to be slow is it going to be like like uh like a very dense chordal um you know uh situation or are you going to have like really quick voicings like um and then you know just uh playing quiet playing loud playing with accents uh how are you using phrasing um let's see here uh you know just uh how are you going to phrase things? You know, like what, how are you going to emphasize, emphasize different melodic, uh, you know, rhythmic, m- melodic, rhythmic, whatever, you know, the melody of a rhythm. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. And then, you know, I'm like, so like, I'm trying to, I mean, I really, that's uh, the psychology of music trying to like, a lot of times the, a lot of people get introduced to this idea of, um, you know, tension and release as one of the key components to how you provoke an emotional response in music. Um, and that often is like looked at as like, how would you look at that melodically? You know, like how are you using um, dissonant notes and balance with consonant notes to, you know, create a create an interesting um, melody that makes sense, that is grounded 
to like some level of, of a foundation or, and is interesting enough where it's not just like, you know, just sterile arpeggios playing over and over again. So, and then which tensions do you use to create that tension? That seems to be like the, the, the entry level concept for tension and release, but just trying to figure out how the, the, the human mind, um, the human mind wants to put patterns together and anytime you can play with expectations and part of the artistry is discovering the multitudes of ways that you can play with expectations, you will then be able to provoke an emotional response. And that's basically what gets you the boner. So <laughs> like if you had, um, you know, simply put like, uh, like one thing I, I wish I had done a little differently with Psyopis is a lot of it, you know, the, the mission statement at the time was just like balls out, fuck you. Um, how, how can we like, you know, grind someone into oblivion? And uh, we, you know, I think we served our purpose and, and it was a part of the artistic statement. So I'm not going to like particularly like talk down on it, but I wish I utilized um, more coherent, concepts within the songs to provoke those emotional responses because a lot of times if you don't give anyone that groundwork um you can it, you're missing out it's just complete insanity and they don't really get to you know really figure out what's going on um but you know we i did do it there are moments that um that type of manipulation was successful uh like the I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to start like saying parts of songs because I think that's kind of like stupid. But um, yeah, Cyphus can they... seem like more complicated than it actually is to other people. Like uh, you know, people that play guitar and stuff can get what you're trying to put across, but other people just want the breakdown. Is, is basically what you're saying, right? Uh, no. Uh, like okay, so like for example, um, all right. So uh, it, everyday standard music within the, the confines of Western culture, within the confines of rock music, you know, each each genre has its like uh, its rules and stuff that become a part of what expectations are. Say you had um, uh, a, a normal four four thing like uh 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 all right, all uh, right. Uh, I'm uh, digging uh. it. And you're like you're I'm starting to get that right and then we go into a chorus and we're like uh 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 uh, you know, it's like we already established it the first time. Then the second time around, we kind of had that going on. And then all of a sudden we go, uh, 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 uh. It, it, and like you, you're expecting one thing. And then all of a sudden that happens. You're like, oh, that happened. Weird. But you have to already know that you shouldn't be expecting to have that happen. You sh you know, you should have other expectations. What Psyopis at times was just, uh, 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 boo, uh, boo, uh, boo. That's what makes you know, it awesome. Like, <laughs> it's a part of it. But like, you know, I, uh that wasn't just Iopus. And I think that we could have, and we did at times, like there was success with that um, in, in certain parts of songs, but like, I think I would have utilized that idea more there, like concepts of like uh, saturation is like when you repeat something over and over and over and over again, out of nowhere, that's called saturation. Um, Holly in the chat know, saying we need an album just of that, just of you making those no noises like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, th I think Mike Patton. I think Mike Patton has that fucking genre on lockdown right now. So so everybody is asking about Limp Biscuit. I know this story. I'm pretty sure other people might know, but uh, you want to give us a little overview? Okay. And I'm so, gonna throw up your uh, video of you. Uh, all, uh, Audition. You know, playing in front of the Bonton. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what the store was? Okay, I, was, I thought it might be yeah. the, the bookstore or something. I couldn't tell. But I, yeah, why yeah. don't you tell us a little bit about it? Okay, so um, I was working C shift in a plastic factory. I hadn't played guitar in months. Like, it just wasn't a part of my life at that point because whatever. Um, and at some point after the second Limp, Bis Limp Biscuit album, the guitarist left the band. And I don't know if it was a promotional stunt or it was legit or where in between, but uh, Lip Biscuit uh, hooked up with Guitar Center and they did um, these like everyday guitar contests regionally, right? Like, you know, it wasn't every guitar center had one, but regionally different guitar centers would get together or, you know, or would be, you know, region would be responsible for a number of guitar centers. And they would go, you know, from um, contest to contest. And, or, you know, contest to contest would happen, you know, consecutively. And it was 
it was a normal contest, but it was also supposed to be like a showcase for potential new Limp Biscuit guitarists. So I was coming to town and I was working in the plastic factory and it was my lunch break. And one of my coworkers is like, he knew I played guitar. He's like, hey man, you gonna go try out for Limp Biscuit like, you know, next week or whatever? <laughs> and I'm like, no nah, man, I haven't played guitar in forever. I hate contests, they make me all nervous. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't particularly care about Limp Biscuit anymore. I did like Limp Biscuit when they first came out and stuff, but at that point I was holistically over it. So he then responded by saying, yeah, I, I totally get it where you blow off this opportunity because you have this great job here at the Plastic Factory. <laughs> and, like, and like, you know, like that was, um, you, know, you couldn't be more, you know, it, the option wasn't, couldn't be more obvious. You have to go fucking do this. Worst case scenario, you're still working at the Plastic Factory. So I, I signed up and the night before it, I, which was like the it was it was it was coming shortly thereafter to that conversation. It was like two days later. So the night I signed up the next day, and the night before the contest, I stayed up all night playing guitar, playing guitar, playing guitar, and I like try to focus on some of the. Uh, I needed to focus on certain techniques that were unorthodox um, and that just were like weird coordinations people hadn't thought of yet, but not particularly like, you know, quick alternate picking or quick legato technique because I had absolute atrophy. I, I literally hadn't been playing forever and uh, literally forever. You can say literally before a hyperbole. It's just insane. <laughs> I hadn't played in a while, uh, but so the next day we get there and they, um, they organize the stage in front of a Bonton in Marketplace Mall in Henrietta. Um, I'm sure no one knows any of those reference points. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have no yeah. idea what a bonton is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I know what a bonbon bon right. is. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> whatever, okay. So, um, yeah, so I get there and first off, I'm nervous because all of a sudden I got to play guitar in front of all these fucking people. And because I had practiced all night, and I hadn't practiced in forever, all of my muscles and my forearms were completely broken down. So I had like no muscle strength. So my hands were already, my arms were already shaking due to weakness, right? You know, it's like I played a lot, but I've been playing guitar my, you know, for decades or whatever, I'll have enough conditioning where I don't need, you know, at all that muscular um, prowess. Anyway, so I lost that. And then even to make it even better, they were, like say I was supposed to go on third, then the like whoever was in charge of like the stage would be like, all right, you're going fourth now. Oh, we're gonna push you back one more. We're gonna push you back one more. That at sucks. one point, oh yeah, I had a no, yeah. At one point, I just I had a conniption pit at fit. You know, I'm like I'm like, no, dude, are you fucking kidding me? So, anyways, I got up there, I did my thing, um, and I won the contest. The unfortunate part is that Limp Bizkit was only at every other. Um, uh, contest and it was their off day when they played in Rochester and it it sucks because it would have been fun like at that time my um, my relationship with music was far more organic like I did have you know I was developing the um, I, I had developed some level of a of uh, of an abstraction for for musical thought um, but I was far more connected with my instrument to do like goofy shit where, you know, especially at the times, you know, like there, there is that hip hop element that was, that was a part of the new metal scene where it, you could be rhythmically making sounds and you didn't particularly have to be harmonically responsible to anything. So if I just wanted to go on the whammy bar, like, you know, <laughs> the drum going, doo, 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 I could go, wow, 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 you know, whatever. And, <laughs> That's what I did. So, but uh, yeah, so um, it was cool. Um, that happened. I heard that uh, they, they own it. everything that you played there. Is that like you had to sign this insane contract and they actually owned everything that you played there? Is that true? They, uh, you had to sign a contract and that might be true. I think, I think, you know, people are just fucking assholes looking for weird conspiracy <laughs> shit, shit, you know. I think, I think what they were saying is because they did, they did videotape it, it was still a showcase for the band to see who was doing what they just weren't going to play with you. After. Oh yeah. At the, uh, I don't know if I articulated that clearly. If you won while the band was there after you had won, you would get on stage with the band and then you would just like improvise. You're right. And that would have been my strong suit. That would have been great, but it didn't happen. Um, 
I think what they were saying with the contract was all of the um, everything that's recorded is owned by us as far as just like we can do whatever we want with the videotapes, you know, like if yeah. You know, like if someone's doing like, so you think you can sing or whatever is happening, chances are whatever videotape they're, you know, they're taping your audition. You can't go. That's my audition. You can't fucking use it. Yeah. You know, so I, th- I think it was something like that, you know, but I, I mean, also heard that you got the job to be in the band and you decided to turn it down. Is that the is that the case? That is a lie. Okay, yeah, that's that what too. I thought. That's I wasn't too, totally no, sure. no, I would have. I would no. Those assholes were hanging out at the Playboy Mansion, man. I my plastic factory job was not <laughs> fucking not. It wasn't my calling by at all. Like, oh yeah, I would have totally loved to be living in a tour bus at that point and just hanging out. I probably would have got kicked out of the band because I would have fucking gotten a fight or something with someone. Oh, but. they would have heard you and be like, "Whoa, this guy's too good. Can't be in the band." <laughs> no, nah, nah, I don't. No, okay, you got it. Though those guys probably had egos the size of Jesus. You know, they're they're probably. I'm sure. Whatever. But is I, this I, a pre or post Psyopus? Pre Psyopus. Okay. I think at the time, I was starting to. Uh, I mean, there. I, I could say transitionary. I could see like transitionary periods from earlier bands to that that had to do with Psyopus. But now that I think about it, no, I don't. I think that was. Yeah, because I think with Psyopus, that was the first. I won an Ibanez guitar, and that was the first time I had played an Ibanez. And you know, since then I've been I've been endorsed by Ibanez, and that's just been like the only thing I, I use. Um, I didn't know that guitars could play better than BC Rich Ironbirds, but no, that was what I was using at the time. So the the point being this, I think shortly thereafter I got really really fucking serious about playing guitar. I was always really serious, but at that point, I won that guitar. I bought a metronome. I started purchasing all the instructional VHS tapes I could just to date myself here. And then, uh, like, I remember I bought uh, John Petrucci's Rock Discipline, which is like pound for pound the best instructional um, video available. Like, every guitarist should have access to that. Um, to which one? Yeah. Uh, John Petrucci's uh, Rock Discipline. Oh, it's just, again, pound for pound. Like, I could, uh, you know, there are other instructional videos that have particularly um, unique lessons to learn, uh, like Alan Holsworth or Marty Friedman, you know, stuff like that. But just pound for pound, man, John Petrucci's uh, Rock Discipline. It's just, it's like two hours of just everything you could ever use to be a prog guitarist. And he's just, he's just stupid good, just stupid good. Well, uh, that leads me to another question I had. Oh yeah, dude, Dream Theater, of course, right? (laughs) I'm kidding. But... (laughs) But uh, I had another question here. If we could skip ahead a little bit. Um, where was it? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, your riffs are, like, super unconventional. You do a lot of weird shit on the guitar. I heard you in another interview saying that your influences for guitar are, like, Metallica and Megadeth and stuff like that. But they don't play, like, a complete psycho. So where did where did all this come from? Like, what we were talking about the whammy bar before and, like, sliding up and down the guitar and stuff. Who, like, how did you get the influence to do that? Were you just screwing around and that's what you came up with? You've never heard Kill em All by Metallica? No, I have, I have, but they don't—they're not like, <laughs> you know, it's tapping obvious, the whammy bar as you're tapping on the guitar, right. playing with just tapping and stuff. Right, right. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, no, I. You know what it, it is? Like, I could. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, from an early, early point in my, um, in my guitar playing. I was always, I always had like the dreams of being a musician and being in a band and touring and everything. And I was always like writing material, you know, whether it was like prepubescent, like, you know, shit smack boner boobs kind of stuff, (laughs) or like trying to write metal songs like, you know, Metallica and Megadeth Slayer, uh, Pantera. Those were uh, some of the earlier influences. Like, you know, the great thing with Metallica is the, um, the, the material is like easy enough to grasp abstractly speaking but it gives you like the chops of like you know doing the downstrokes doing the triplets getting to do a power chord and you know after that megadeth becomes far more complicated pantera does as well um and then you start you know learning some of the more like i mean you could play kirk hammett solos but they're generally just like you know this uh pentatonic like pentatonic solos with no like blues feeling um kind of like a generic feeling but a generic feeling um so okay so like from the early point 
some somehow in my mind I, I I stumbled upon this idea that has held true for the thirty years I've been playing guitar, and that I can I should always, I always want to be as original as I possibly can. You know, like everyone, I think Quentin Tarantino once said, like, everyone's already done everything. It's just how are you going to do everything differently, kind of? Like, how are you going to interpret every type of gangster movie or blah, 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 blah. And I figured as long as my mission statement was to try to be as unique as possible, that would manifest into whatever it was going to manifest. You know, like, sure, someone's used a whammy bar. Maybe someone's used a whammy bar exactly like I have. You know, but like, as long as my intentions were to do that, and like, I want to take any music theory lessons. Like the first like 10 years, I was just really trying to develop my own theory because I wanted to isolate myself from as many outside influences as possible outside of the music I really, really liked. Um, plus I had an antisocial personality. So that's like right up my alley to just say like, fuck this, fuck that, fuck norms, fuck norms. Um, I was the same way. As, yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of a lot of metalheads are that way, you know, because they're true. listening to dis dissonant music that you know just doesn't really um, cooperate. So uh, one of the cool one of the one of the things I'm really proud of, as far as my influences go, is that as far as Psyopus goes, particularly two of my two of the most influential hand down hands down. Most influential influences on Psyopus was a local band in Rochester called Lethargy and a local band in Rochester called Calabas. And I think it's really fucking like we have in Rochester, we're not too far from Canada. Canada kind of has like quirky metal stuff going on. And here we had a lot, of, we had like quirky tech metal going on. We had a really cool fucking music scene. We probably still do. I'm just like, again, nose in all the books right now. Um, but it, I think it's just, I'm like really happy that two local bands were really so influential in what I did with my band, as opposed to everyone having the traditional, like, you know, John Bonham and Tommy Lee are my favorite drummers and fucking, you know, like just all the, the standard standardized influences. Most people here, um, obviously um, calculating infinity and pig destroyer um, burnt by the sun. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think of like all the other all the other bands from that era all had a lot to do with influencing me. But as far as just being weird and quirky, that that was kind of what was going on in Rochester. And then just I played guitar so fucking much, man, you know, and just weird shit just kept happening. As long as you're like paying attention, you know, and you can find something. You know, a lot of times you make a weird mistake or sometimes I, I one of the one of the things I suggest for my guitar students, if you're trying to come up with something different, pretend you're having a seizure on the guitar, you know, just start like freaking <laughs> out. It'll be it'll That's be nonsensical. Awesome. <laughs> but like if you're paying if you're paying attention, it's like you're fishing, you know, you're fishing in the okay. in like the rapids, you know, the rapids and somehow you pull out. Oh, my God. What if I go? You know, like you're, all of a sudden you're doing something neat. That's awesome. But, but you have to pay attention, though. <laughs> so you're saying your that question? that nobody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was asking okay. where all your weird techniques come from. So you're saying that you were just messing around and they just popped up then. Yeah, it's I mean, isn't, more that, and more. isn't that kind of. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of creative stuff happens. You know, you're just fucking around and something happens. That's fucking but, sick, dude. Huh. Yeah. What about, like, like the uh, idea of tapping for, like, whole songs? Because that's basically what you're doing most of the time on the guitar is just tapping. I haven't heard of another guitarist that actually does that all the time. And especially in metal. That's not, like, a huge thing. It is a thing, but it's not like mm -hmm. everybody's constantly tapping all the time. So didn't was right. that, like, weird for you? Like, to be in a grind band and you're tapping the majority of the time? Yeah, it made me feel very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, let me see here. Um, it was just another idea. I think. I think another part of the mission statement was just trying to pull in as many influences as I, as I possibly could. And uh, you know, I had the idea for tapping. You know, and it just kind of fucking happened. You know, that's um, cool, man. That's cool that you're, like, willing to take the risk. You know what I mean? Because, like, uh, a lot of other people... Well, I'm sure people, like, have seen you and been like, what the hell is he doing? Like, you're supposed to be playing, like, grind chords, like, stupid power chords and stuff like that. And you're over here just like... Right. Bee -bee 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 and it's like... Right. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it never... It never seemed like what I was doing was really, like, um, inappropriate or whatever. Yeah, I mean, part of... Uh, 
part of Psyopus was just kind of like trying to do everything different. So that would just kind of run a line with like the current of the band, you know. And if it, it you know, and really there's no, you know, there's like Siobhan's song, which is totally not grindcore. There's like a, a murder to child that like the the uh, chamber piece at the end of Odd Senses. Um, it, yeah, you guys there, are pushing you know, the envelope in all the different directions. Eh, well, eh, yeah, or moreover, anything we wanted to do, we would do it. As long as there was something that we thought was innovational or there was something that was just extremely brutal. You know, like if, if we just, we're pummeling. Sometimes I forget, like everyone, like I don't listen to my band that often, right? And every once in a while, like I'll put it in. I'm like, Jesus, we're so fucking angry. Like, you know, it's been so long. I've got, I've like read a lot of Buddhist books. I've grown up a lot. I've, I've, I've wrestled some of my demons since then, you know, and I forget like it, it's a lot of it's pretty relentless. So, you know, if, as long as it was maintaining that integrity, either like, you know, um, as, as innovative and as extreme as possible, then it, it was all right, you know. So, I mean, like, you know, if, if there were ideas that were coming that had to do with finger tapping, then we did it, you know, so. That's sick. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I totally got you, man. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of questions in chat. I'm trying to scroll up to the top. Hold on one sec. Okay. Oh, yeah, what effects do you use? For uh, the guitar, I'm pretty sure it's like nothing, right? Yeah, I don't use any effects. Dude, that is so like, sick, uh, man. <laughs> the, um, the the long road to the fourth dimension, there is this one part in the middle of the song where I go like... <laughs> and, then we, and then I hit like a reverse pedal and it goes back. That's the only like effect I use. Outside of obviously we're in the studio, I'll put a little chorus on the clear tone. and. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, no effects. All natty, baby. I like it. Yeah, you know, the whole thing is that like, I just, I have a, like I, my Achilles heel is gear. Like if I could do it all over again, I would have invested um, more resources into having their gear. Um, but the whole point was, you know, you know, as I was saying, like, you know, the sky's the limit for ideas as far as creativity goes, it would only make sense to throw pedals throw in effects you know have like a sick fucking like midi fucking rack or whatever and i wanted to do that but i didn't because i was intimidated by the idea of having to rely on a chorus pedal breaking or a whammy pedal breaking or you know whatever whatever tool we might be using that would be a, a, a effects pedal so i just didn't you know and we got by we got by so dude yeah, yeah it sounds amazing um Again, Guitar Costas is asking, how proud is Chris for making Pew 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 Guitar Effect in our puzzling encounters so much more before Car Bomb? I have heard the Car, the Car Bomb, Bomb song, thing. right? Oh, you haven't? Okay. I haven't. I, I, I saw it. I saw someone make a comment about it. So, um, Car Bomb's cool. Their drummer is fucking ridiculous. Their drummer is so good. And I like that. Uh, I'm not sure who, I think the singer and the drummer at least, they were in a band called Neck before car bomb and there they were they were um a band that really got me excited too during like the era when uh, you know calculating infinity was um you know new and on the scene or whatever so um yeah i got nothing but respect for those guys if they um got some more mileage out of a cool idea fuck yeah that probably it's probably a really cool part of the song <laughs> something tells me they probably like it's been my experience sometimes people will hear some shit like that or whatever um they're probably doing their own thing you know like maybe they are i mean if they're literally doing the same thing i did on my guitar by all means fucking it's flattering or they're really clever and it's cool they're probably doing something different that just yeah i'm pretty sure they're like using it. it's like an innovative uh, idea the wall, uh, the wall pedal i'm pretty sure is what it is that's doing it oh really okay yeah um so i mean we're not putting anything out someone should be putting something out with the fuck right <laughs> right uh chonks barkley's asking was the capsule skit a, <laughs> right was the capsule skit a nod to crotch duster <laughs> no <laughs> i remember uh i remember my buddy jody who got me into all the like he got me into the underground metal scene you know i was just kind of like this like closet musician who like the heaviest band I had ever heard was like Pantera, and then he got me involved in that. And he got me into Crash Duster, or he exposed me to them, but I can't really really remember much about them. No, um, when remember I was saying the, uh, the prepubescent music or whatever that I wrote when I was younger. 
my my closest friend CJ and I had this genre of music called shit smack. And, you know, it was just all the ridiculous <sighs> shit that we would do. Like our first album is uh, Shit Smack But Issue 92. It's a fucking <laughs> solid album, solid, great deep tracks. Um, but yeah, like, so we just have, we have catalogs and catalogs of just like some of the dumbest, funniest shit. And the capsules um, ad and the, uh, what was it? The, the journey of what she swallows or whatever <laughs> the ad. You know? But, you know, just anything, anything remotely, you know, anything that's like that type of like, you know, just dumb humor um, comes from that part of my development as a musician. So, you know, I just saw it as an opportunity to like, wh whenever I did anything stupid, like, I, like whenever we put an album out, I always try to like, just get my friends involved and come up with dumb shit. Cause that's just how I roll. So we got together and we did that. Is but, a no, shit I, I smack available online? <laughs> there might be something somewhere, <laughs> you know, it's just been, it's been so long. There might be some like defunct, like uh secondhand mp3.com or garage band or something like it. You should put it out there, I, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I I should. I should. I, if I if I had a little more money, I could probably pay an assistant to do all this extra <laughs> shit for me. <laughs> but right now, I've got my hands full just trying to be able to, like that. The music project I am working on, that like Lucona Gaia thing that we kind of got sidetracked off of. We don't need to talk about. But like that's like it's pretty ambitious. So it's like taking all of my time and energy. So. It's 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 just like I got a list of shit I should do, you know, shit I should do. I'd love to. I mean, there's some funny shit on that. I'd like to actually, if I have the time and the resources and, and the ambition enough to do so, I would like to actually go into the studio and record, like, the prime cuts from the, the, the huge Shit Smack catalog. There's some great shit on there. We used to, like, whenever we were in Nashville, we used to, there's an acapella song called Douchebag Fever. And uh, that was always a very common play song. Like <laughs> every time we played at the, I think it was called the Muse in Nashville. Can't remember. It was like, I don't think they're, I think it's a Domino's, right? Domino's Pizza right now. But yeah, that was always a, a part of the performance there. So yeah, I'd love to record <laughs> that. I'm sure. It, what did the label think, think of your hidden, hidden tracks? Um, did they I, know they well, existed? <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest mistakes I ever made, uh, I'm not even going to talk about that. All right. Well, I'll say this much. All right. So, you know, they always talk about hidden tracks, right? Like, and, and what it ultimately is, is it's like, it's a track that's not listed. If the last track just keeps on running, there might be something there, right? That's what it is. Well, what I had an idea was coming up with like 10 completely, or I'm sorry, two 10 minute um, hidden tracks, right? And that, you know, at the beginning of, uh, if, if we're talking about the odd census one where we're doing the one way ticket to hell song, one way ticket to hell, so right? Good. So we actually recorded two different versions of the one way ticket to hell. So when anyone was listening to the CD, everyone knew that one way ticket to hell came afterwards. But unless you listen to both of them, you wouldn't know that they were different. I mean, they were different, you know, like we were saying goofier shit, playing weirder music. But the idea was, then from one way ticket to hell, it would just keep going on into a completely different hidden track. So there's going to be albums with this hidden track and albums with that hidden track. Um, oh, so like, okay, so you're saying that there's two different uh, odd senses: one with the way with one way it ends, and one with another way that it ends. Right, and and, okay. and the thing is, and if you were talking to someone about it, like if you had one version and I had the other version, we we could both talk about how the song or the album ends with one way ticket to hell or the hidden track starts with the one way ticket to hell but unless we heard it we wouldn't know that they were two different versions of one way ticket to hell okay. so what ended up so what ended up happening was metal blade wasn't into supporting my idea on that they were willing to do one as the release on the ju like you know on the in the tangible form and then have the other one as the release on the mp3 form you know like if you're buying through you know online or whatever and it wasn't good enough for me. So what we ended up doing was we just combined all of them together and, and we lost one of the one way ticket to hells. I, I, I love that. I keep referring to something as the one way ticket to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, so, yeah. So I don't even know where that other version of it is. I, I just this moment, you know, 12 years later, I'm realizing I could probably find it and hear it. And, you know, that'd be kind of interesting. But um 
so that was that's the only relationship worth explaining i remember when we did the um on our puzzling encounters considered we had the 30 minutes of the word annoying repeated over yes. and over again <laughs> and uh yeah I, like i fucking hate myself sometimes so <laughs> dude i thought I, that was I, good you didn't like that well now? no no i no i, I love it <laughs> I, I think I think there's only one way to release that album and it is with a half an hour of the word annoying repeated <laughs> over and over again. But I, I, when Brian Slagle, the owner of metal blade, we had put out that first album and, you know, he has all these albums he's putting out and he's super cool and like super supportive. And I'm, I'm like, I go up to him. Like, you know, once I, I met him for the first time, we put our album out. I'm like, yo man, thanks for letting me put out the half hour of the word annoying over and over again. <laughs> And he didn't know about it. Like he maybe never even heard the album. That's and it's awesome. like, dude, he's got another shit. But he, I could tell he did, he hadn't heard it. And then I just started mocking him to his face. I'm like, you haven't even heard our album yet. Like, <laughs> Dick, this guy's like signing you. He's like putting all, thousands of dollars into your fucking band, man. And like there, I think there's a couple opportunities we probably missed out on because of my bad attitude. I mean, it was a part of. Well, I, I am surprised he hasn't heard it. Like if he's putting it out, you know what I mean? You think he'd give it like a listener to well, they're they're putting a lot of material out, you know, and like, you know, like if I, if, if I was, you know, like I, you know, maybe you would think maybe he'd listen to a couple tracks. Maybe he heard like the first single we put out, you know, and if you wanted to hear more cool, but like, you know, now that I'm like reasonable about it, it's like he, they were, they're putting so much fucking music out. You know, I don't want to fucking hear that much music, you know, yeah, and not for true, nothing, you know, you know, he started the label when Metallica started. How old is Metallica? Like 800 years old, you know? So like, I think it's more like a thousand. You know, yeah, something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, he probably um, so, took like a couple of seconds. He probably listened to the first track for a couple of seconds. He was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, and that's he, the other thing They're like, too, you know, right? that's what the kids are into these days. He's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like he, he doesn't want to listen to that. It's too fucking, you know, it's, it's annoying. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, like, whatever. But yeah, so. And then, uh. Yeah, I think that's good enough for the... I don't even remember. There's a hidden track something on the first album. I don't even remember what it was. Yeah, it was... Um, oh, I forgot how... It was like some some crazy dude talking about God or some shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't really oh, get no. that one that much. Dude, the, but the other two <laughs> ones are amazing. They're like my favorite parts, parts of the albums. Not even kidding. They're so freaking good, man. <laughs> oh, I, I still want to. I, I still want to say what happened for that, it, and I'm gonna get my nuts kicked in half because of the PC culture. Or yeah, I was gonna say you don't have to talk about it. If you, you know, it's, it's all. Good. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> fuck it. Well, I, was, I don't give a fuck. Everyone can eat my dick. So, um, like, I worked in a residential home, and there was this older guy who um, he was like uh, this older dude. He played he, uh, he played very bad keyboard, and and he was allowed to get drunk. Right. Like um, they would put there's this stuff that you could put alcohol in to make it like a pudding and then he could eat the pudding. And and um, OK, he, like I, I don't remember what was happening. He's like playing the piano and like I was tape recording and then I just started writing like stuff on a piece of paper. Like you're go like God does. not I don't remember what, but I'm making it up like God doesn't love you. You know, this shit. So I wasn't talking to him, but he'd read it and go, no, God loves me. You know, <laughs> just trying to get him to get a response or whatever. So, you know, it's just like some really weird, um, <laughs> weird stuff that happened. I don't know. I don't think anyone got fucking hurt. And for the sake of art, why not do a little bit of weird shit here and there? So, so, Good times. so, <laughs> <laughs> so Siopus isn't actually a word from as far as, as far as I can tell, what does it mean? How did you yeah. arrive to that? We were trying to, um, we were trying to, I was living with Greg, the drummer from the first album, and we were just trying to come up. The band was originally called Strangle Fuck. That was the, uh, I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Yeah. And then at some point we realized as brutal as that name is, it's going to probably close more doors and open sure. them for us. <laughs> so we were trying to come up with names, you know, um, we did think about Chimera and fortunately there was already a band called Chimera. And then one day I was just, uh. I was like, I was like laying on his bed and he was at his computer and it just came to me, psi opus, you know, which was like psychological psi prefix and then opus being like a collection of music or whatever. So we just put the word together. It made sense. And it was just like, just seemed to, at that point, it was like an aha moment, you know? So 
it stuck. And it's also kind of like psychotic opus, you know what I mean? It kind exactly. of fits you really exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It does. So, uh, I heard that you went to school for a year. Did you actually like learn anything there or Oh, fuck yeah. It was like one of the best decisions um I ever made. I'd gone I had gone to jail for like a year or not a year, a month. And when I went to jail for like a month, I was just like, man, I'm not getting anything going with my music. So when I get out of jail, I'm going to go to school for music and like try to do like horror movie soundtracks or something. So when I, so then I signed up for school and like I had said previously, like most of my, most of the, the way I wanted to handle my development as a musician was just making my own theory, discovering shit on my own. And then like, you know, cultivating like some really unique idea. And then I started picking up like, um, you know, as many, as much of the self-instruction stuff I could get, hence the, the VHS tapes. But then when I went to school, it was great because I got exposed to so many things that I would not have been exposed to. I wouldn't have been guaranteed to be exposed to like, uh, the four part harmony concepts, serialism, uh, romantic era musicians, Paganini, Chopin, um, you know, there was just so many awesome things that I I, I learned. Um, not that I wouldn't have stumbled upon some of that, but it was just like, it was all there for me. And I might not have, you know. So um, that was awesome. And uh, I did two semesters. and But we got signed by BMA that, like, one of those semesters. And so it was just like, you know, that's what I've been waiting to do is get signed and have someone support me traveling all over playing music. So I, I did do that. I went back to school uh, again for like a year doing like jazz guitar shit. And then I quickly changed to like, um, I got a couple extra op credits to do like human services. And then I just realized I don't want to fucking do any of that shit. You know, I like what I'm doing right now. I like being a server. I like giving guitar lessons. I like playing music all day. So, so was school like instrumental to your sound in Syopus? Well, was, I mean, it was instrumental to like the writing and sure. stuff like that. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I had already kind of developed like a, you know, a, a pretty strong methodology or, or idea of how music was supposed to be. But like the introduction to um, Death Eye wouldn't have happened if it weren't for uh going to school because i want to learn about like four-part harmonies and everything actually it's funny the um greg wanted to do this he wanted to just come up with like some generic keyboard cello like intro to death eye like he wanted to just like plug the keyboard in and go like you know just do some random notes and like it gave me such an anxiety attack that he was going to put in this like bogus filler shit so the night that night before he went to the studio the next day i wrote the intro to death eye because i was just like fuck i'm not gonna let him put this generic bullshit on the album and then um the first imogen's puzzle which was actually written after imogen's puzzle part two part two that was the original one the uh, imogen's puzzle part two is actually the original one but it wasn't on an album yet so like whatever but uh yeah like so like i ended up like i learned about like again i used four part uh, you know, I, a lot of the stuff I used when writing that was based off of stuff I learned in um, theory. I think the the clear tone intro or the clear tone interlude of Kill Us was um, influenced by what I learned in school. You know, and I, I'm sure I could just like you know spend a little okay. more time thinking about it. But yeah, definitely, definitely, I'm so happy I I went to college. So what did you go to jail for? If you don't want to talk about it, it's all good. Oh no. Um, Let's see here. Uh, so I was in an automobile accident. All oh, right. So sure. I'm a recovering. I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. At the time, I I had got, I like so I had like a I, I'm pretty sure like I, I had like one of those like uh, records that was like you know because I was young it wasn't you know like it was a hidden record I can't my it's just slipping my mind you know whatever like I was only 17 so I don't have a record but the record did exist and. Um, I had been sober for a bit and then I had relapsed and nothing really bad was happening, but um, I was drinking again and I was in a horrible car accident, it had nothing to do with drugs and alcohol. A 80 year old woman ran a red light, hit my car. I went off the side of the road, head onto a tree, went through my windshield. Jesus I was in a coma Christ. for four days. 
yeah, it sucked balls. Um, so I was <laughs> That's like, one gonna, way I, to put it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, it was the only way they woke me up. Put the balls in his mouth. No. Um, so, uh, so after, um, like, I, I, I basically slept for a month. You know, because I had frontal lobe damage. And New Year's Eve, um, New Year's Eve came. The first time I left my house was Christmas Eve. And the abs- the accident was like 27th of November, 26th of November. The first time I left my house was Christmas Eve. And like, you know, a week later was, uh, was New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. And um, my first appointment with a neurologist was January 4th. So no one had talked to me about what to expect from this the 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 impact of the frontal lobe damage yeah which is impulse and aggression problems so new year's eve we're all hanging out at my buddy's house it was like probably like a, a dozen and a half of us all we're all like you know chums from high school and stuff yeah there's an apartment upstairs apartment downstairs they connected we opened it all up we're having just a huge you know fucking fiesta and I started drinking and uh, long story short, I tried to kill one of my friends, like literally tried to kill one of my Jesus friends. Jesus Christ. And oh yeah, it was crazy. So because of that, I got on, I was put onto probation and well, like um, I broke a window. They had to call the cops cause I was going cuckoo bananas. Um, and when I went to go to court, it was, I was only going to get in trouble for like criminal mischief in the fourth for like breaking a window. And like the my my public defender was just like um he's like yeah if you plead guilty then you just do a year of probation and i'm like i'm not trying to get in any fucking trouble like i can't believe i went berserko you know that was the last night i ever had a drink by the way that was like 20 years ago um so congratulations like, man it keeps me out of jail so uh <laughs> uh what was it like like i'm like i'm not gonna try to get in any trouble like yeah fuck i'll do a year of probation fuck off right but i wasn't used to the condition I was going to be in with the frontal lobe damage, like you really take for granted how much you rely on your memory, even if you're someone who doesn't have a good memory, you know, like you, you have these general, you and the second person, I'm assuming most people have this like general intuition of what they can and cannot handle, you know, like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I have to remember to eat or I, I don't know, I'm not going to come up with any good ideas off the top of my head. The point was this, they made me go into a rehab program because I had the previous, um, I had the the previous uh, record of, you know, having problems with drugs and alcohol. And they're making me see like a a counselor for like uh, aggression problems, which I just didn't have, but whatever. And I had to see my probation officer once a week. I I wasn't, I was on the straight and narrow. I was doing my, I was okay, but I kept missing appointments, kept missing appointments because I kept forgetting. And the worst was I had this, like my therapist kept canceling the appointments by just telling me she'd leave a message on my answering machine. I'm canceling the appointment. I'm rescheduling you for this day, like without even asking. And I, if, wow. unless I wrote it down, unless I wrote it down, I wouldn't remember. And even if I did write it down, I wouldn't remember. And in fact, when I had to go to court, for all the, the, the violations of me missing these appointments, I forgot I had to go to court. The cops had to come to my house and grab me. I was like, I, whatever. So I, I went there and usually you plead like not guilty, you know, and then you go through like, you know, a, a bargaining process or whatever. And I pleaded guilty. I was just so defeated because it, it was just, you know, I, I had had a very growing up. It, I had a exceptional memory. And now my memory was just crap. Like it was, I was just so defeated. So they, they only made me go into jail for a month and uh, that's that. But it was cool. I started writing Imogen's Puzzle Part 2 in jail and I, I wrote half a scissor fuck paper doll in jail. Like I wrote, I drew a little fretboard, like, cause it was right when I was like playing guitar so much. And like I was, I had the, the, the sickest regimen and now all of a sudden I'm stuck with nothing to do. So I, I had on a sheet of paper I drew like a fretboard and I just started coming up with like all the different <laughs> patterns I wanted to play on there. Were so your doctors was, like I, worried that you were doing that stuff after like the frontal lobe damage and stuff? They're just like, oh God, he's going crazy. Worried that I was like... Just tapping on a piece of wood? Oh, uh, no. I mean, it, I, was in, I was in jail. No one gave a fuck about me. There, well, that's my true. Doctors didn't true. The, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they didn't give a fuck about me. Yeah. As long as I wasn't like getting in fights or whatever, which really wasn't my thing anyway, so... So, so that's how I was in jail. I heard that you needed that the label needed to see you play live to prove that you weren't like speeding up a tape that you could really play as fast as you were playing. Is there any truth to now, that? Um, 
Mesa Boogie wanted video footage of me playing guitar to prove that I was really playing the at, at whatever speed. So I had sent them a VHS tape or whatever. Did you end up getting endorsed? Oh, you didn't? No, no. Yeah, I don't even remember what the fuck happened with all that shit. Yeah, it just didn't happen. So, um, is I it think, hard? I think I just got lost. Or good. Is it hard to get endorsements? Period. Since you're doing all this weird stuff. No. <laughs> like, I, I mean, <laughs> okay. I, never, I never. I never. You know, it, it's. I, I will say. Um, yeah. No. Like, I, it just kind of happened. I don't know. Like, I wasn't. I don't know how any of this shit happened. To be honest with you, I don't. I mean, I only have. I guess I only have the Ibanez endorsement. You know, as far as endorsements go. Um, but you didn't try with I, anybody else besides Mesa. Yeah, I don't. I think that someone approached me with okay. Mesa. You know, like here's the thing. Like with Ibanez, I kept like blowing it off. If Mesa was contact, if Mesa was contact, I probably was blowing it off because I was just in La La Land half the time. Like, I was sober. Um, I was sober every. I have never played a live show under the influence of anything ever, um, which sounds like I really missed out. It would have been cool maybe if I did once, but no, actually, I, I, don't, I don't know if you get could any. play under the influence like with the shit that you have, man. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'd probably make a huge mistake. I remember, um, you know, like so I used to tour with Hank Three, and I remember him telling me that he was when he was playing bass for Super Joint Ritual, they were playing in. I think he said San Francisco. I, I, I don't think it, it matters so much, but he was telling me about like, oh man, we made a mistake. We all took mushrooms before the show, man. <laughs> it was really hard. You know, he was just saying he, he couldn't, his bass was even like connected to his body and shit, <laughs> which, you know, like we can laugh about it, but when you're the one who's actually on stage. Yeah, you'd be losing your mind. Us, yeah, that's that's no good. You're just, you're just, you're just, you know, holding on for dear life, waiting for it to end, you know? <laughs> uh. So, how did you get hooked up with Black Market Activities? How did you get signed? Um, Guy contacted us. Uh, we were like, um, we were like number one on the grind charts on MP3.com. And God, that's a name you don't sent... hear anymore. MP3.com. <laughs> oh, I know, right, right, yeah. Been a long time since Psyopus began. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So, like, uh, the the very real truth is, again, like, I was like. You know, I was pretty isolated, um, so I kind of knew what was going on. I, I hadn't heard of the Red Court or anything. He had sent me like an email saying, like, "Hey, I got this label. You know, we're we're interested in like you know discussing possibly putting out your stuff." And I just didn't think of anything about it at first because I just I just never know what the fuck's going on. Like it's insane. The stuff I I, I obviously I spent so much time in the scene that I learned shit, but so. That might be a part of my style too. I isolate so much. Like, you know, I really try to isolate. So I didn't know what was going on. And then I was working at like a, a calls. I was like uh, doing telemarketing or something. And I had access to the internet and the phone, you know, like it, no one was fucking with me. So I was just like, you know, dicking through emails. And I, I, I saw that email he had sent me again. So I just contacted him because like not knowing what the fuck was going on, which it, I'm happy that happened because I could have easily has just blown that off. And then we went and assigned with Guy. And it's possible, like, Guy was a huge catalyst towards us getting signed with Metal Blade. Like, they, ha uh, I did, I, I had heard from um, some members of Metal Blade, like, they were familiar with us and they were going to approach us. Um, but if it wasn't for Guy, we probably, like, Guy definitely facilitated, A, that we got attached with Metal Blade. But two, that we got a really, really good contract because of the association with BMA, and he hooked us up with um, his lawyer. So we got like a really, really good, like good contract with Metal Blade. So I'm very grateful that um, guy put the interest in us, and I'm very grateful that um, you know I, I I emailed him back. You know, I just, I just had no idea what was going on. So how do the contracts work? If you don't want to talk about it, it's all good. But how do the contracts work with like Metal Blade and stuff? Or how did they work? Um, I'm sure it's different now. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to a guy once, like, you know, the, the scene has changed so much. And he was, like, saying something like, you know, because we can we can put another – well, I'm assuming if everything was normal, uh, we could put another – we have another album with Metal Blade, you know? Like, they could – I don't know how that works. It might be, like, the NFL. Like, they have a contract for five years with a player, but they still drop them two years in or whatever. I don't know what the fuck's going on. But he did say that – I, I'd have to, you know, I I definitely would have to like connect with them to see how 
the situation is different because, you know, the, they would probably put a different budget for us or they would probably, you know, think things are just so much different now. So I don't know how it works today. Um, but back then, I can say back then, uh, I mean, I think the only thing that was really noteworthy about our contract is like um, the the approach to tour support. Um, if, if I'm correct, Victory Records would sell you your discs for like top dollar, like almost as if they are selling you their discs. I think if I'm correct, I might be wrong, but the story I heard was like, I think between the Buried and Me's like first label was like Victory Records or something. And they just had a horrible deal where like, if they wanted to buy their albums to sell on tour, then they'd be buying them for like 10 or 12 bucks, you know, something just Jesus ridiculous. Christ. That's how much you'd be. So I mean, the numbers might be shortly off, but the, yeah. the spirit of what I'm saying is, and if it wasn't, I'm pretty sure that was with BT BAM. Um, but that like, so that's like one side of the spectrum, which is not ideal. Um, what was very common for most of the bands with, um, with metal blade was like, they'd sell you your discs for like six bucks. And then, you know, you sold them for 10 or 12 or whatever the fuck. Um, but what guy did, um, which he guy, guy was just, guy was from the scene. He was from the street. So he was like, you know, he, he was cool. He was super fucking cool. Guy's awesome. Um, but he would sell us our discs for three bucks. So I, I, you know, I might be wrong somewhat. Like I think, you know, the jewel, the, 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 the discs maybe cost like a buck 50 each, you know, when you're buying them these mass quantities, and I think he would sell us them for three bucks. So he's still, you know, recouping something, right? But the idea is it's like a way for him to provide tour support for you. So like, look, you're going to make money. You know, if, if you're buying this for three bucks, you're selling it for $10, there's seven bucks, you know, versus the only four bucks you would have gotten if you bought them for six. And plus that, that burden of purchasing it for six versus $3, is a big burden when you're like a, you know, a DIY grind band, you know, just, you know, the playing for gas money sometimes. Right. Right. You have Metal to make Blade, a big investment up front. Hoping. Yeah. You get and, and, yeah. And you're, you know, uh, unless you're one of the very fortunate bands, you know, you're, you're not making, uh, un, you know, unreal amounts of money. So, um, Metal Blade, they, because we had the same lawyer that Red Cord used, with um when they signed their metal, metal blade deal um which was awesome too because he he did it where like the i think it was the band shy halud was a, one of their members was our our lawyer and he did it a that the metal blade paid for our lawyer so we didn't even have to pay him you know like we didn't have to like oh man we got to try to find a good lawyer how much is that going to cost i mean that would have just been so stressful he worked it out that when the album comes out for every album, like, you know, a thousand dollars or whatever the number goes to the lawyer. So that was, that was advantageous. And then also, yeah, he, he got it worked out. So we only had to pay $3 for records, which was, it, it, again, that's just, that's really advantageous. That is that's extremely cheap. Good. Like even for today, that seems pretty cheap, man. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and otherwise, uh, for the label, I, I otherwise I, I don't really know what to say about the contract. They'll have like these are the uh, you know the amounts of money they're going to give you for each album or whatever. So I, I think at the time it was like we got like oh fuck I remember like maybe eight grand for the first one, ten grand for the second, like sixteen grand or something for the third or some shit. I can't remember. Like that's the uh, the payment they gave you up front before you started recording and everything. Well, the. the, uh, the it, what I think they Advanced. did was like they pay, they pay, yeah, they, well, they pay, you, they would allow you to take like somewhat of an advance. Like I took like a $2,000 advance off of the second out, like for odd senses to like buy some recording stuff. So I could do like the interludes to, um, uh, what's it? Uh, boogeyman or whatever, or like, you know, pill, you know, the capsules, whatever. Um, so I did that and then, and then what I think they did was like, so if you were going to go into the studio and it was going to cost you 10 grand, they would give the label five grand up front and then the other five grand after the album is delivered. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So. 
What is your greatest musical accomplishment? I know these sound random, but they're in they're in like separate categories. But uh, yeah, yeah what what's the, your what's your greatest musical accomplishment? What the fuck is wrong with these guys' questions, man? They're so random. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think um, playing playing in Moscow was probably uh, the thing that out of um, out of everything that happened. I, think I was kind of thinking about. you were gonna say it, and so I have the video up of uh of you doing Imogene's puzzle. <laughs> oh, I hate that. Oh, <laughs> dude, so let me tell you the story about that. Wait, one, one second, one second. Chad, if this is too loud, just tell me and I'll mute it. Okay, go, go. So we we went there and we played uh, Moscow and then we added another Moscow show like the day after or something like that. And um, we needed more material to play because it was a different show, like whatever. So we're, I, you know, Imogen's Puzzle Part 2 is usually with, uh, or, it, you know, on the recording, it has a full band, but it's something that I can play by myself. And I'm like, fuck, but it's like, you know, we're burned out. I'm like drinking Red Bulls to survive, you know, and, and like, it, you know, it's, it takes some real precision, you know, tapping and it's clear tone too. So you really kind of like, if you, it, the, the compression of the distortion isn't going to clean up any of your mistakes. But I'm like, all right, we're going to get to this one. I'm going to get to this one part and it's going to be hard to play. But since I'm playing by myself, I can slow down the tempo in real time to adjust to my capabilities, right? But here we are, we're playing there and we're in Europe. And what do they do over there? <laughs> they start clapping. So all of a sudden, they just set the pulse. Like, I can't play against it. <laughs> you can see it on your face in the video. Yeah. You're just like, oh my God. <laughs> I, I straight up, no, it, yeah, in the video, I straight up stopped playing. I'm like, because I fucked up. I'm like, ah! And then I just kept going. But yeah, that happened. Dude, uh, things like that, that are happened. awesome, man, because it just shows that oh, you're yeah. like human, man. You know what I mean? Like, this is an awesome sure. video. Awesome video. Uh, uh, yeah. So that that was probably, and then um, that was happening. Being signed was pretty cool. The Ibanez endorsement. Um, I'm, you know, I think I, I got to uh, scratch my like dream itch when I was like when I was touring with Hank and you know I lived on a tour bus with him you know on and off for like four years. I was like, I had felt like I arrived some to some degree. So that was I'm happy that like that's a part of my story. Um, Are you a big country music fan or no? No, no. He he um <laughs> yeah he he um discovered Psyopus on tour it was super joint ritual and double driver and like if i you know i don't want to misrepresent hank but i'm um I'm, I'm pretty sure his his story was like he um he was way into metal he just wanted to do metal but because of a, a couple things that had happened in his like um something you know some things that happened in his life so he's like all right i'm gonna start doing some country and you know he can do country he grew up on country you know fucking, he, like and he did it you know and, and he's got a lot of really awesome country songs but like his like you know his his soul is a met he's a metalhead right so um he you know he got turned on to Psyopus and you know he had a Psyopus sticker on his like bass which is always cool you know whenever you saw like posts or like pictures in like the you know tiger beat magazine or whatever and uh he, uh, I, I can't remember what happened exactly, but I think I was just talking to him. I think Lee had just left the band and just like on a whim, I'm like, Hey man, if you need anyone to play lead guitar for you, just let me know. And he's like, Oh really? Like, and like, like within 24 <laughs> hours, he flew me down to Nashville. And then, you know, the, the rest is tons of fucking debauchery <laughs> like the stories i have from touring with hank are some of my favorite fucking stories but yeah he's he's super cool i'm very i'm very grateful for that you know it, it's cool that i got to he was really cool because like he was so supportive of psyopis that like i did like over a thousand shows between 2003 and 2009 and i put those three albums out God and like damn. you know worked on them but the thing is he like i'd get home from psyopis he'd be like you know a third into a tour and he would still be like like cool enough to like fly me in you know from wherever my, you know from rochester to wherever the tour is at have someone pick me up from the airport and then i would go on the other two-thirds of the tour he was just like hank was like really super supportive he's like he's such an awesome fucking guy so it, it's cool that you know i got to do that and um oh and no this is definitely my favorite thing um i'm like 
uh, Phil and Salmo called me out of the blue one day and asked me to be his like guitarist for like this crazy metal band. He's like, I want to start the most extreme metal band ever. And I keep asking around and everyone's pointing out your name. So I looked you up and you're just fucking insane. And like, we, we kept like in correspondence, but it happened like right after like Syopa stopped. So I got excited when he called me because I was Pantera. I had Pantera posters all over my bedroom and stuff. So like having Phil and Salmo call you is just like surreal you know, and, and especially because he was he wanted to start a band with me because of the way I play guitar. Like that's just you know that it's such a um, spiritually fulfilling compliment. You know, and um, but I just had um, it was just at a time when like I had just became jaded from just working too hard with Psyopus, and um, I kind of fucking got you know I just got distracted by everything. So I wrote a bunch of riffs, did some songs. We we talked a couple times about it, but it, you know. It's just it's hard to organize shit these days especially if you're doing a million other things already and you're also so trying did to like that settle an- down around the time right yeah well it was like uh you know like yeah, i mean like i i think you know at some point it's the at some point if it hasn't happened already it's going to be obvious that i can never that that will never come into fruition i mean there's a chance i could probably contact him right now and if I had material, I'm like, all right, let's fucking do this. Cause he's like, you can put the band together, you know, you know, I just want some input. We'll work together or whatever. And I, I'm sure if I was to do that right now and send it to him, he'd be receptive to it, which would be really cool, you know, to work with one of my like childhood heroes. But what I'm assuming will probably happen is there'll be a certain point where I'm a certain age and it's just obvious that that isn't going to happen. And I'm going to just suck up the regret of never, you know, actualizing, taking the potential to, you know, work with one of your like, like you know, childhood heroes. Like if I was, if, if my 21 year old self was going to learn that my 31 year old self would blow off an opportunity to like write an album with Phil Ensemble, like I'd probably go to prison for murder, you know, for murdering myself. Like, yeah, one, of those yeah. weird par- one of those time traveling paradoxes or whatever. <laughs> So now that you're uh, starting to adult, oh, well, I mean, you've adulted for a while now, but when you started to adult, you ended up opening up uh, the uh, Exploding Fingers Guitar Dojo. What made you want to yeah. do uh, lessons? Because um, I have a passion for guitar and I have a passion for theory and it's a, it's a pretty decent peripheral income. And um, yeah, you know, like I wrote those books, like the, I'm working on a number of books. And I, when I went to school the first time around, you know, my, 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 one of my professors was like, Chris, you got to constantly, all these ideas you have, you have to be writing them down. You have to be journaling them. And, uh, you know, I think that the Exploding Fingers series is pretty, it, like, it's got a lot of, like, innovative new ideas in it. Like, I, I think it really is offering some material that you're not going to be finding anywhere else. So I'm proud of that. Um, but I think that's kind of like, uh, you know, I think that's kind of, um, it's like somewhat f- like spiritually fulfilling to actually like put them together, like, you know, kind of, um, what is it? Uh, you know, uh, what's it? archive concepts, you know, that I had for, you know, both, both music theory and perhaps how it relates to the guitar. So, um, it's a part of who I am. Like if you talk to any of my, you know, my buddies, Growing up, I was always putting together weird books of like music notation and music concepts and putting charts together and figuring out notes. It's just kind of like a knack I've been. It's been a part of the way I exhale and inhale. I, uh, I have all your books, by the way, and I've, I've actually oh, used some of the concepts in like my music. So it's I wish I could say cool. that I do the exercises every day, but. Nah, uh, <laughs> like it's, nah. it's so hard, man. It's so hard to keep up with all that, dude. All right. Like, all right. it, it's awesome that you make that stuff, though. Um, how can people get in contact with you for lessons? Um, the the best way would be through my Facebook page, probably. Or you can go to artmandude at hotmail dot com. A R P M A N D U D E at hotmail dot com. Or if you like, just look me up on my Facebook page. That's probably the best way to do it. So. Yeah. And it's uh, yeah, facebook.com slash christopher.arp.549, I think. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Dude, I've had to tag yeah. you a bunch, and Facebook does not like right. me just typing in Chris Arp. So I have to, like, right. get your whole uh, tag on there. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, how often cool. would you practice every day back in, back in the day whenever you were uh, at, at the peak of your game? 
you have no idea. Like I still do it. Like you, I all I did was play guitar, and that and that's like one of the intimidating factors about trying to work on material I haven't worked on in a while because I really what all I did play was play guitar. I remember I was talking to someone the other day, and we and and I I would like like you know people would hang down in the scene or whatever like i again i was like a closet musician that just did my own thing and then i i met some people that got me introduced to the music scene in rochester and then you know i'm like i'm starting my, my social group in the underground you know grind tech scene is like building and i would go i'd start going to these parties where you know everyone's hanging out friday night they you know go to the bar then they all go to like a party afterwards and i like i barely even know these people i mean i know them you know i'm getting to know them i definitely know them well enough to be there but i didn't and i didn't even think anything of it i would still bring my guitar and just go sit in the corner and just work on shit that's all i would fucking do <laughs> i must have looked like i was like you know like some idiot savant or something you know just like like wapner <laughs> i'm just playing playing guitar like it, it just it, i mean it, it paid off because you know i think I, I i got what i put into it but yeah when we were like um when we were uh rehearsing for our puzzling encounters considered john the drummer and i like day in or like day after day after day we were often up there 12 to 14 hours a day just working on the material for Jesus. that album yeah yeah um, how thick were your calluses um could you even bad. feel them like could you even feel no. through them <laughs> yeah you know that's that's weird you think you would get i think I, I think after a while it's not that they get so thick it's just they don't they your your body eventually figures out there's no reason to put nerve endings there. <laughs> you know, they're just like, no, what? Don't even, we'll, we'll move to like whatever to other places or something. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I that's all I would do. Like if I would, um, you know, it, it's like there's <laughs> I have some great social skills on one component on one part of my life, but I'm completely socially inept with other ones. But yeah, I'd always bring my guitar everywhere I go. Like I go like and like over the years, you'd hear stories from like my buddies and stuff how much they'd hate it. <laughs> you know, like I'd be playing, they're, they're trying to watch like, you know, I can play guitar and watch TV and not think anything of it, but other people who aren't playing the guitar might not want to hear me playing guitar while they're trying to watch the, you know, the 76ers game or, or, you know, I'd go to buddy's house to watch movies and I'd be doing it and yeah. No one, yeah. You're in your car in traffic are, are and you just break out the guitar while you're waiting for <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't break it out. It was already there. It was oh, like okay. on my, of on course. My, I put the, the seatbelt thing. The seatbelt's actually a, a <laughs> strap for the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Right, right. Uh, so yeah. what's your writing process for Psyopus like? Is Are you just seizuring on the guitar like what you were talking about before and seeing what happens? Or is there more thought put into it from the beginning? Um, I, I think I usually approach that question with just saying, like, I, I, I try to be as creative as possible as coming up with the different ways to, you know, write. And if, if you're, the more time you can spend obsessing about writing, about, you know, a specific composition or about writing as general, like when you're listening to other music and just hearing weird ideas and stuff, the more ways you can do that, um, I think the better off you will be as far as having, um, uh, well-developed songs with tons of ideas or whatever um so my point being this you know sometimes i would uh sit down with a sheet of paper and a pencil and my 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 guitar and write something you know compositionally and one idea or you know like i might come up with something that'd be more traditional and and a theoretical approach or i might be coming up with something like uh the song insects was my answer to fly to the bumblebee on acid all right so like i had this idea <laughs> okay. and then i put it together like that um the song um uh, the pig keeper's daughter you know i had this idea about having a song that's tons of slides and if you listen to the song it's just shit sliding all over the place the song two is about Siamese twins, and the idea was that the whole song is going to be stereo oriented. And when you listen to it, every moment of it is stereo oriented, right from the beginning to the very end. Um, let's see here. Uh, um, you know, like so you you know you have these concepts and you try to put them together. Like, uh, not I don't know if everyone knows this, but like when you listen to Siobhan's song, we recorded like there's the basic part where you could pick up the guitar and just play it like you're playing a classical guitar, right? But what I did was I went through and I notated the entire song where 
like on track one, we could put all the A's. On track two, we put all the B flats. On track three, we put all the B's, et cetera, et cetera. So there's 12 chromatic notes. You know, it'd be in different registers, but they'd be responsible that, you know, that track would be only responsible for the A's, so on and so forth. And it would be weird because some of the, the notes were like on weird beats because they were like the third note or the fourth note played in like a, a succession of like 16 notes or something. And it's a long song. It so is what freaking we, beautiful though, man. Uh, thank you. So cool. <laughs> um, but like, it, so though, after we did that, we, we equally panned the, the, um, the, the 12 chromatic notes across the, the, you know, the speaker, whatever you call it, the, the oral plane. Yeah. And so when you listen to it with headphones, ideally those 12 tracks are, are going to each note is going to be sounding like it's dropping in all sorts of different places. And then the other 12 tracks, Everything was just guitar on that. The other 12 tracks represent, like, I do have this, like, uh, computer version of that song with, like, where I wrote it with, like, an orchestra, you know, like, full on, you know, the wind. Really? And the, yeah. Um, but so what I did was I transcribed some of that stuff and then played it with the guitar, you know, to, like, you know, to fill in what those other instruments would be. And, of course, yes, I did use effects and shit like that when we were in the studio to kind of, like, an Ebo for this and, you know, different things to get, like, different tones. Ah! And, um... <laughs> So like we took that concept and, and, and we did that. So if you haven't already, listen to that song with headphones on. How much um, did your engineer hate you at the time? Oh, the best part is, yeah, it took us three days to do that. And Jesus he hate, Christ. <laughs> he, he didn't hate me. He didn't hate me so much because we did that. What he did hate me about was at some point in the middle of the song, you know, it's, it's got that do 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 And then it just stops the all the, those little raindrops stop and you just hear the other 12 tracks like the violin and the wind you know the quote-unquote violin and wind stuff but he had edited like we had edited the entire fucking song underneath that you know like over that time just because that's how we put it together and there wasn't supposed to be any of the 12 notes which were really you know monotonous or like a very meticulous um tedious process and I'm like, oh, yeah, that part's not supposed to be there. Cut it out. And it's like a solid minute of fucking all this, like, you know, like really tedious engineer work. And he's like, what do you know? What are you talking about? But, yeah, no, it's not supposed to be there. You know, and he was so mad. He was, I don't think it was the mad. Yeah, that was that was probably the most I've ever let him down before. Uh, so but OK, so anyway, so there's there's abstract concepts like that. And then sometimes you come to you write you know a quarter of a song or half a song and then you bring it to the rehearsal room and uh other people add to it or everyone writes together in the room and that stuff's going to be kind of different or a lot of times when you're working on the material like some sometimes it's really cool is when you're you, you record your rehearsal and then after you're done with your rehearsal you just keep listening to your rehearsal over and over again so then when you're like listening to it over and over again you might hear different ideas and when you're actually playing it you know, so like you're playing your song, you're thinking about how you play it, you're thinking about what it means, what you're expecting in cer one certain like dimension. But then when you go home and you're listening to it, you might have another idea because you're not using all the, you know, the brain waves required to actually perform it. Or what works really cool is sometimes you make a mistake, you know, because you're learning the material and like, you know, someone does this or does that, they make a mistake that you wouldn't have intentionally done because it was a mistake but it sounded fucking cool. So then all of a sudden you rewrite it into the material. For example, my favorite one is in the, in the song Horn Meat Liar, it's like, the, you know, that's one of the songs where we really take advantage of the idea of like having peculiar lengths of, of rest. Like, you know, we'll rest for five beats or seven beats or three beats, you know, just playing with expectations, right? There's a part where like, where, where there's a rest and it's like, da -da 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 like the drums just by himself goes, da -da -da. Da, 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 da. What happened was when we were writing it, he did that because he thought the time the the uh, the rest was only like three beats, but it was really supposed to be like seven beats, right? <laughs> the numbers okay. don't matter so much. But all of a sudden, it was like that was a really cool kind of like embellishment right there. All right, you know. So then we just kept him going. So that that'll happen. I mean, just like every approach you can possibly come up with would be. A method of no shit hey every approach you come up with for writing <laughs> will be an approach you can use for writing <laughs> five I, I, man I, I, <laughs> yeah. you um, ever do a improv jazz i guess it's kind of what you're doing in the practice studio but like i mean performing 
Um, no, I mean, I went to school for jazz um, the second time around because I wanted to go back to school and they try to force feed fucking classical down your throat. And I just had no, I have so much respect for classical guitar, but it's, it, it, why would I spend my, why would I spend my time trying to do something completely different than, or different enough than what I want to do with the electric guitar. That being said, man, the amount of time and effort you have to put into being a competent jazz musician is, is exceptional. You know, anyone that you know who can play over those chord changes, uh, you have to give like mad props, mad props. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a very, it, it takes a lot of dedication to be able to do that. I know, I know a bunch of like the theory and stuff, you know, cause I'm a, you know, a theory nut. Um, and you know, and obvious, I, I like, I, I spend most of my rehearsal time as far as chops working on the potential to improvise, um, not over a, like a two, five, one chord progression as far as jazz goes. Right. But like, um, there's other, you know, there's other forums of, you know, of, of organization one can improvise over. So I, I need to make the distinction between jazz and other forms of improvisation. Um, but yeah, man, like a, a lot of the, like the ideas in my books and stuff, like, you know, I, I really try to, um, put those together at one time. Um, when Aldi, Aldi Miola, is like this like ridiculous amazing guitarist at berkeley and he gets discovered by chick Corea, and um chick Corea like or tells him to start writing material you know want to compose some music and ld and uh ld meal is like no i can't i can't compose music and chick Corea is like can you improvise music and he's like yeah and he's like well then you can compose you know so they're like someone who can compose music can't necessarily improvise but someone who can improvise absolutely can compose music. You know, you might you might be missing certain um, insights or intuitions onto what could be a good composition. But you can't say that you can't compose music. Just fucking improvise over four measures of music. There you go. <laughs> you know, right. transcribe it. There you go. You just wrote a fucking song. And um, the ability to be proficient with the technique you know, required to express yourself on a guitar is key, especially um, for the type of music I'm trying to do. You know, the, the, it's there's a multitude of avenues I would like to use to express myself with the instrument. And one way to do, one way to keep on top of that is just constantly working my chops to be able to be proficient in improvising, you know, because if, if the better I can perform on the spot, that's less like cerebral energy I have to waste trying to figure out how to play so I can think on like higher levels, you know, like, uh, like with the relative interval theory book I have, like, there's like, you know, whenever I'm teaching my students, like material from that, you know, it's just like, at first, you're just learning how to use the fucking, you know, the building blocks. And it takes that energy, you know, that that focus to make sure you're using the right blocks, and you're making the right distinctions. And, you're trying to put shit together, but ideally you'll do that long enough where you're not thinking about it anymore. And you can think on a higher level, kind of like uh, poetry. You know, if it's one thing to learn German, it's another thing to learn how to write German poetry. First, you have to get the language down. So as far as, you know, improvising goes and how I, you know, rehearse, um, that's usually, that's one huge component of how I approach playing the guitar, which I'm not sure if that's exactly the question you asked, but that's the answer I'm giving you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it, man. I'll take it. So what are you working on now? Well, I'm, the working name is Tolu Konagaya, and it's... Um, Tolu that Konagaya. Music. Yeah, that's okay. the working name right now. Um, so I had a... Uh, it's basically um, the the initial like orchestration would be me playing electric guitar and singing i have an acoustic guitar player i have a percussionist i have a drummer and i have a bass player and we went into the studio and we started we recorded half of four songs i had wrote and then i i it i got i split with a girl and it was just like i was already kind of jaded from all the the trials and errors the psyopis i'm just like fuck it <laughs> you know so, so half of it's recorded just sitting there but that was like 10 years ago and it's just manifested like I, I when I when I stopped doing Psyopus like as my gig um, one of the things that made it easier for me was that I just wasn't listening to metal music you know I just really wasn't you know I'm listening to all this different shit and I'm like I'm gonna put 110% to this new idea 
and I have this vision and I can, I, I suppose I could describe the vision. Um, but it's great that I've been putting together this vision over the last 10 years and how the theoretical concepts have, ha have developed. And, um, I'm like really excited about it, but yeah, like, uh, um, like I'm listening to, I, I I've been studying, um, flamenco music. Um, I just finished a book about tango. Um, I'm, I'm like really stuck on Egyptian folk music. I don't know why people don't utilize more, uh, belly dancing rhythms. Like seriously, like if you, if you're just, just set, set, like, you know, look into like Egyptian folk music uh, or any of like the, the drum solos those people do, it, it's the coolest fucking shit. I don't, I don't know why people don't use it more often. Like if anything, you'll hear like, you know, Shakira play one song where there's like a lot of it or something, but like no one, it's, it's so fucking cool. But anyway, you just send me studying. like YouTube videos or something about that. That shit sounds interesting. Sure. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, I've been studying like Northern and Southern Indian classical music for the last 10 years. Um, trying to get a lot of, uh, the, the rhythms are cool, but like the expression, the embellishments, the ornamentation, with both the vocals and the uh, the way they play their instruments are like a huge turn on. So you're um, making essentially world music then? Uh, it's part of it. Like I was just about to start going, like, you know, Jeff Buckley is like a really huge fan of, uh, I'm a real huge fan of Jeff Buckley or our female vocalists as a whole. Like the only male vocalist that I listen to um, and then I'm, and I'm pulling in like expressive um, influence is Jeff Buckley, who's effeminate, <laughs> but, uh, but like Marvin Gaye, like I was listening to Al Green and Marvin Gaye all day today before we started, um, this interview. Um, but yeah, like I've definitely, I, I think a lot of like the, the, the Oriental, the, the gypsy music, uh, some of that, like that we term as exotic, like I'm not, I don't care about Irish music or anything. Um, any any of the I, I definitely have like I could you know continue this list of world music for absolutely so that has a huge part of it but my favorite um, my favorite music is like club music so I'm like I'm trying to pull in a lot of Latin rhythms because I want to be able to have music people can dance to not that that gets the theme but like it is something different than what Syopus did before we are the antithesis of dancing <laughs> before, no man you know, that's like, like straight up <laughs> dance music come on now <laughs> yeah I'm telling you man. <laughs> Yeah, move over fucking Kanye. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah, like um, it's mostly progressive. There's a, I mean, there's a lot of really, so those there, th those are influences that I can say that are that are relatable for the most part. Like uh, I, a lot of the jam band stuff. Like I, if you look hard enough through my history, you'll find like a black and white picture of me standing on a soapbox at a kill Dave Matthews rally. But like when I stopped, when I stopped the metal, and I was like. I decided to start looking throughout other, you know, looking for new dimensions of musical exposure. I got into Dave Matthews and I, and I realized why they are as successful as they are. Cause they, they do have a certain in intangible component to who they are that the other jam bands, regardless of how they are on the spectrum, as far as like, um, you know, the commercial goes, they really do have something unique. Um, but I think I I hated Dave Matthews probably because I hated their fans back when I was in high school. Like all the kids I fucking that listened to them, I could care less if they were alive still today. Not true. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah. Well, you're also but, into you know, metal like, and stuff. You probably thought that was just some poppy bullshit. Like that's how I yeah, was back uh, in high school. Sure, sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that that that's one of the one of the more unfortunate components of metal. It's like you live by the sword, die by the sword. It's like the 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 elitism right I, I don't miss it i don't fucking miss it at all i don't dude i was just straight up metal elitist in high school man i looked down on oh, everybody yeah. that was wearing like their sister's pants and stuff and straightening <laughs> out their hair and stuff dude i actually listened to our puzzling encounters considered back in high school and turned yeah. it off just like a couple seconds and i was like this is just guitar like masturbation i didn't understand it at all and then yeah. like uh back in 2016 uh, that was like back whenever it came out or whatever and back in 2016 i was making a black and death metal album right and and halfway through i'm just like all this shit sounds the same man all these bands sound exactly the same like what like what were these kids listening to back then because that had to have been something you know interesting because that was at a time when things were exciting you know and then i go and listen to uh see you next tuesday instantly hooked and then i listened to our puzzling encounters considered after that and it was just like 
mind exploded, man. Like, right. it's crazy. So, like, I, I feel like metal elitism happens to us early. Most of these people you're hearing on the internet are probably just fucking kids. Mm -hmm. And as you grow up, your uh, your your highs and expands in terms of like well, musical you know, development. It, it, it is like like I said, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. It is kind of a part of. It's like the it's like the black matter that kind of expands the genre. You know, you just have to have this like dissonant, uh, like um, it, like lack of connection with that that is wholesome. You know, you kind of have to just be pissed off. Hey, you know, again, the, the word extreme belongs in metal. You know, and why would you have to be extreme? Like, what is the what is that like soul force that's pushing people to just go more and more extreme and it's in an aggressive way, you know? So, and, and it stems from, you know, I, I think it is a younger person, like, you know, kind of like what you're piggybacking off what you're saying. It is like a younger person's like genre. And, you know, especially for like men, we had this, like the, this like boiling over testosterone with no right. spiritual skills whatsoever, you know, like, <laughs> you, you know, your nervous system is freaking out so much. You, you do the best you can, but you just rationalize that every pissed off attitude you have is really like appropriate and, and, you know, and sensible. But in the end, you know, you're really just a dick. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but whatever. So back to yeah, what I we mean, were talking about though, is there music for this project available anywhere? Like on the internet, we can check out. Oh yes. Yeah, something. Oh no, no, no. I'm working on it really hard. My, um, it's great. My buddy, Ike. Okay. So like we were working on that project and, uh, the drummer I had, like I had a percussionist and he hooked me up with this drummer named Dyke and he had done a year at Berkeley and he got mono. So he came home and then we started working on me and him were like working hard on this Luke Conan guy project. And then the, the split happened. So he went to, um, a record, he became, he went to a an, uh, music engineering school in, in Arizona for 14 months. And then afterwards got this really swank gig, um, work like he worked on like Adele's second album, uh, half of lady, uh, lady Gaga's third album. Like I, the first time, like, uh, Stevie wonder is one of my heroes. And the first time he called me, like when he got his gig, he's like, dude, I just finished recording Stevie wonder playing harmonica. And I'm like, fuck you, dude. Right. So he's like rolling with all the, like these really great connections. And, um, and he's been just trying to get me to like finish it up. And I've just been distracted because of me trying to function in this world. I was an adult and like, cause with Syopus, it was the only thing I thought about like, Oh, I should eat today. That's probably a good idea, but can I write a riff first? You know, that was like where I was coming from now. Like, you know, I, I'm like, I can't work on Phil Ensemble. I'm not going to work on any more Syopus material. I'm not going to do my podcast. I'm not going to put out a shit smack album. I'm just going to focus on this, like, you know, this material. So I'm, I'm working on that really hard. I do have material. It's not available yet, but the point being this, I'm, I'm working really hard on it. And, um, all I need to do is get down there into LA and he's got the studio and everything set. And then we'll be able to work on that. So it's coming. It's, it's my passion right now. That's that's why I'm I'm doing nothing but reading theory books and stuff. I'm just really trying to go, you know, it, I'm trying to close out the rest of the world. I'm glad the Buffalo Bills are done with their football season now because it's like less distracting for me. Because <laughs> I, re I really like the Bills and they're doing really well. But okay, they lost to Kansas City. Mixed emotions about it. Now I can kind of just tune out everything and just work on my guitar. Uh, so what was, oh, well, I guess we should do this. Yeah, yeah, let's do shows. So what's your best show that you ever played? I guess the Moscow one. That was cool. Um, touring with Cannibal Corpse was cool. Mm. I think I um my my I think one of the one of the, the coolest moments was um so they used to have a really big festival on the East Coast called Hellfest. And uh it the it was in like New Jersey. It was like three different stages and like, you know, and all sorts of big, it was like a big one, you know, like Dillinger would be playing, Fear Factory would be playing, Converge would be playing. And it was like right when we were buzzing really hard. And remember I was telling you how like, I was like kind of like in La La Land with my endorsements. I want, Ibanez wanted to give me one free, one free guitar every year. I wanted to, nice. and, um, and well, or at least to start off with two. And they weren't going to do it. And I'm like, all right, like I was going to sign it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I just never got around to it. So I think Ibanez thought I was playing like hardball. <laughs> but because <laughs> what happened was when we played Hellfest, now 
it was right when we were like really exciting and it was re it, like Hellfest brings in bands from everywhere, but it, it's somewhat regional because it came out of Syracuse, which is near Rochester. This was in New Jersey at this point because it was getting so big that it had to find some different venues. But anyways, we played we played at Hellfest and it like they're really on time. Like when you're done playing, you're done. And they keep, you know, festivals notoriously get behind schedule. They're on top of their fucking game. And when we played Hellfest, we got encored and we legitimately did an encore. And like encores are unheard of at these festivals, right? But like people were going sh like crazy and it was really, really exciting. And like um, that night, uh, Mike Faley, the president of Metal Blade, called up um, Mike Taft, the, my, my rep at Ibanez. He's like, yeah, so I hope it's just fucking I got an encore at fucking <laughs> Hellfest. So, and so, the so the next day I got my two guitar deal like that. So that was that was kind of that that felt really really good you know um did you actually yeah. go through two guitars in a year oh i i needed to have a bunch of them because i played like an asshole you know like it was you know i just needed i needed to have backups you know i just really did so and i could you know i i could i mean all my guitars are all beat to fuck they really really are beat <laughs> to fuck you know uh, you know, like just I had the bipolar energy. I was fucking mad. The music isn't relaxing. And with uh, especially when you're on stage and shit's going on and you have bipolar impulses, the dumb shit you'd be willing to do, like throwing your guitar, and dumb stuff like that. Like I did a lot of stupid shit. I'm really surprised my guitar didn't break more often. You know, what is your uh, your guitar like? What, what's the one? What's your like the one that you always get? Uh, I think. It's an, I mean, all I do, honestly, all I do is play like a, um, acoustic shred guitar. I, o I only pick up my electric guitar for guitar lessons on occasion. Usually huh. I'm still teaching tapping shit on my acoustic. But um, that being said, I can't remember exactly. I think it's like, a, the, the name's changed and shit, but I think yeah. it's like, a, it was like a RG420 or something. I guess and you don't, I don't know what kind of pickups you, you were using then either, huh? Seymour Duncan Invaders. Here's a good story. Okay. This came up in a, on another fucking podcast. I, um... <laughs> All right. So I got endorsed in 2003. I'm in the catalog. I'm getting free guitars. In 2005, this, uh, the, the lap steel guitarist in Hank 3 teaches me how to tune my guitar. <laughs> he taught me how to tune my guitar for the first time. I hadn't been tuning my guitar right the entire fucking time. <laughs> but what was going on was, so I had a trim system, right? And you like... What I would do is I would have the guitar like this and it has the whammy bar, you know, and it kind of like I put the strings on. And then when I was done, I would get up on stage to play and it was all out of tune. I'm like, what the fuck? So I'd always have to adjust. I'd have to start like adjusting it. And it was always like flat and all this shit. Now, when I was touring with Syopis, as long as the guitar was in tune with itself, you really didn't notice because the bass, like uh, Fred's bass didn't have like a lot of definition, you know, because like I was playing all this higher register stuff and he would kind of fill up that like oral space behind it. So if we, if we were, if our intonation was slightly off, we wouldn't have noticed. But when I started touring with um, this happened, I was filling guitar for Red Chord. We were having this issue. It was the first time I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And then when I started touring with Hank, like I found out what was happening was, you're not supposed to tune a guitar with a, a trem system while it's laying down because gravity pulls the whammy bar down and okay. adds tension. So then when you lift it up, the tension's released and everything gets flat. And like, yeah, I'd already been, I'd already probably had three three guitars from Ibanez by that point. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, why is that? I fucking don't know how to play that. Guitar. I don't know how to tune my guitar. It's hilarious. Man. Holy shit. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just dumb. What's the worst show you ever played? <laughs> all right uh there's probably a better answer but i'll go with the first associated one. <laughs> oh god so <laughs> all right uh, um there's probably other ones but this is the first one that comes to my mind we we are doing a tour it was the first show of the tour it was in some who knows where the fuck are we like like town in new york and um never heard of the city uh, never had been there, never went there again. But I will say that the writer to a T was taken care of. Like usually the, the promoter will take care of most of the writer, but like maybe the towels won't be there or maybe this won't be there, whatever, right? Everything was taken care of. Like, all right, and we show up, there's 
tons of kids, tons of kids. The place is fucking packed, right? And the way it worked was like you had a bar and you went down the bar. There was a wall and then you went through past the wall through a doorway and there was a stage. <laughs> and, and we're like, oh, there's so many fucking kids here. We're getting up. We're setting up. And by the time we started playing, there was like maybe three people in the room. I think they were all there to hang out. Like the band that opened for us was like a, like this like new metal band, local band, and everyone probably had nothing else going on in that town, and they went to go see their friend's band play. Yeah. Somewhere in the middle of like the second song, we all realized we're playing in this empty. We're in a room. There's no one in the room. <laughs> no one at all. And so we're all just, we just looked. We're like playing, and so. <laughs> Because we're assholes, what we did was we would just um, – oh, yeah, remind me. To, okay, I got to say the uh, – talk about the uh, the knitting factory in California. So, yeah, we just started – we just sat there for like 15 minutes and made noise just to fucking make noise, right? <laughs> but did then, you still get paid? Right, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice, sure. I nice. mean, that, like, that, that's a part of the deal, you know? Because, like, the idea is that the, the promoter – is pick, like you say you're going to do a tour a portion of it is this tour is going to happen the the booking agent puts out like a mass email and any promoters who are interested in the show contact them then there's also contacting promoters like hey do you have anything open on thursday the whatever day and uh because we're going through you know we're trying to fill in an empty spot now it, the you you negotiate you know a number of different things and but part of the negotiation is the promoter assuming that they're going to get people there because they're going to pay for it. You know, they're paying. They're, it's a guarantee, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. um, the only time that doesn't really happen is like sometimes like if you are uh, if you're a booking agent and you have like a really successful band, like say you say you uh, book Metallica and you have this band you're trying to develop, you're trying to develop called The Boners and no one wants to go see The Boners live, right? <laughs> so you, but you might call- They don't want to see them because they're just a bunch of dicks. <laughs> just a bunch of dicks, that's all they are. Yeah, <laughs> they're stuck up dicks. All right, so anyways, <laughs> um, so what ends up happening, but what will sometimes happen is the booking agent will contact a promoter and say, hey, I need you to book um the boners on thursday in rochester new york and the and the promoter normally would say like no like no i can't like i can't give you the money you want no one's gonna come and sometimes they'll do it because they have a relationship with the booking agent that also books metallica so it's like if you don't do this and you're not going to get metallica you know wh which is guaranteed money so sometimes that relationship that's a part of the relationship like really good booking or really good promoters have like a pool of money that they play from it's like a part of being a promoter is losing money you know it's just like it's like a it's an expense it's an overhead but if you're you know if you're successful at it you you do really well you know because you're helped develop the scene you're helped developing those bands that are yeah. coming through so you know two years down the road three years down the road you're going to make more money whether it's the bar whether it's you know ticket sales so you're saying but, in this situation y'all were the boners yeah we were the boners yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, no, but the th no, I, I mean, yes, like, 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 why say any, any otherwise, right? But no, like, that's, that's when you are dealing with the booking agent that's like top notch like that. We had, um, for that tour, we had this guy, Dan at Thunderdome, awesome fucking guy, so fucking cool, but he was like starting up and like, there was only like a few bands that hold, held any weight on his label. So, or on his like, on his like roster. And we were like one of the top echelon um bands on his roster which wasn't that exceptional like we did all right we toured way too much but we did all right but we it was like a real it was an air it was an issue with development because it's not like you know like the idea is he's starting and we would become more and more successful so other bands would then under development would be able to ride on our coattails right mm -hmm. But so uh, the point being this, th no, the, the promoter at that show, if he worried about fucking not getting his money back, you know, he was an idiot or, or like, I mean, like, you know, he, nah, I'm not going to say he's an idiot, but the point is, let me oversimplify all of it. I got, we got the money. We yeah. got the money. <laughs> but like, all right, that, I do got to say this though. One time we played in, um, we played the knitting factory in California and I kind of feel bad about this, but. It is what it is, you know, fucking life is art. So we were on tour with See You Next Tuesday 
and heavy, heavy, low, low. And it was the last show of the gig or of the tour. So, you know, we just had to do like dumb stuff. We spent the entire fucking night. I stood at my amp looking the other way. I would only move a little bit this way or a little bit that way with my one foot pivoted. And I can't remember what the other guys did, but all we would do is play the song, play some Skinner over and over again, or we would jam Nothing Else Matters, or we would improvise in the key of B. But we would, that's all we would do. And we would do it multiple times. Like we play Nothing Else Matters again. Then we would play the improv. Then we might play, play some Skinner like four times in a row. <laughs> and uh, and then play nothing else matters by Metallica again. We didn't sell any merchandise that night, <laughs> but like, <laughs> like, but yeah, you know, like yeah, we did. That was just like that was just a really bad show, <laughs> you know. Um, that was a bad bad show. But like you know, I wasn't. That's why I feel bad because people drive sometimes hundreds of miles. I was gonna to say they're play, probably some upset people, you know? huh? Oh, that yeah, that like fucking assholes. And not for nothing, it was it was a good like it had we performed appropriately, it would have been a great show. There's a really good turnout. Um, but n see, that's, the I don't know if it's because we played too many shows or because of like the antisocial component of manic upswings. We didn't give a fuck. You know, it was, it was first see you next Tuesday and heavy, heavy, low, low, like watch us. We're going to be jackasses tonight, you know, and that's what we did. So uh, I'm sure people might remember it who saw it and think, you know, foul feelings. Um, but uh, I, I'm willing to believe that heavy, heavy, low, low, and see you next Tuesday might remember it a little bit, you know? So that's what was more important to us. Were they so doing, some, were they messing around as well? Or did they play this? I can't, I, I can't remember. We did play, Um, we played in, uh, we played in Omaha, Nebraska. And we're, we're I think we're playing in front of like three or 500 people at this venue. And Priya, is a band from Omaha, Nebraska. They were signed on Black Market. I think our first like full US tour was with them. So we're, you know, we're really like bros or whatever. And uh, I don't remember who it was. One of them, I hid behind the stage, uh, behind a curtain for the entire show and played the entire set behind a curtain. And one of the members of Priot was out there with a the guitar pretending he was me the entire <laughs> fucking show. That's great. <laughs> like, which, you know, with, or, and I got, I got one last story. This it's kind of related, but everyone who gives a fuck should hear the story. So, um, you know, after, right before our puzzling encounters considered, like the lineup completely changed, you know, like I, there was a lot of stress in the band after our puzzling encounters considered and, you know, just through attrition, you know, the lineup changed. And now at the point, one of, uh, at that point, one of our band members couldn't get into Canada. Um, so we never played. Canada because it was like and, and it sucked because we're only like an hour away from Canada and Canada loves quirky metal music they love quirky metal music um, actually the first shows that were ever offered to us you know as we started out were in Canada so now we're we're now that we have a different member in the band we're gonna go play Canada and we have this tour lined up and everyone in the band's really really excited and everything um, but when we get through the border now I can't go through the fucking border and like, you know, and it, that's a whole nother story. I had to get a certificate of rehabilitation and do all this bullshit to uh, enable myself to go through Canada. Was but that because you got arrested that... or? Yeah, it was part of it. Yeah. Okay. Like I had, a, I, I mean, I had a long, I have a long fucking, you know, <laughs> all right. I, I, yeah. So, you're good, you're good. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I also can tell the mortal Kombat arcade game story too. That's usually a pretty legendary one. But anyway, so we're at the fucking, we're, we're okay. So we didn't go through, we bought all this fucking merchandise. We're about to go through and, and, you know, everyone's like bummed or whatever. And Harrison was our vocalist at the time. And Harrison really wanted to go through Canada, go to Canada and play. And he talked to Jason, the drummer and Mike, the bass players, like, do you think Chris will let us go play without him? And then they're, they're kind of like, you know, like worried that like, I wouldn't let him do it. Cause it's weird. I'm like, Fuck, no, weird. go ahead. I'm like, you want you want to go fucking do it? Go ahead and fucking do it. I'm like thinking, we just bought hundreds of dollars worth of merchandise. At least you can sell merch. Yeah. So they, so they, it was a tour with Fuck the Facts. They went and they played like you know a ten day you know tour in Canada, up the northeast side of Canada, as like a Siopis cover band without a guitarist. Like, think about that. <laughs> think about it. All right, Siopis is a very guitar-oriented band. Like, you can't say you're in Siopis and not recognize 
that the guitar is probably the most important component of it. Nothing on me. It's just that's it. You know, it right. is a very strong. All right. And then the other three members had never even been on an album. Right. Never. Oh, really? So went, <laughs> right. So they went on tour, three man members, never been on an album without the guitarist from Psyopis, <laughs> Psyopis through, through you That's know, crazy. They just <laughs> do they have like a and backing they, track? Like, did they pipe in the guitar? Oh, no, they, no, no. Really? The bass player just, he put distortion on. Like, I think it was like. <laughs> it's not even close to the same. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> I do because I've heard the story before. I totally thought they would have had the guitar going on in the background, like through oh, a, no, a no. track. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, like they have balls. That that that, that takes <laughs> that, some serious balls. It does. It does. How yeah. did it go? How did it go for them? Do you do you know? Well, I I think I mean I think it went all right. I if I if I'm correct, it's like I think everyone knew what was going on. You know, like I I think everyone in the scenes and shit. It wasn't like. They were ambushing people like, you know, someone drove like all this way. I'll excited to see Psyopus. They show up and it's a big fraud. I mean, it might have happened. I hope not. But it was like all the promoters and what was going on. Uh, you know, all the websites were explaining what was happening. So, um, you know, that that affected the draw. Uh, but people still came. People just wanted merchandise. You know, we hadn't we hadn't played over there yet. So, you know, people were just again we hadn't played there yet we would put out both of our albums you know we've been together around it was like 2008 and we've been do, putting you know we've been we existed since like 2002 2003 so they were just you know there were people that were just really happy to have us over there you did y'all so. ever go back with like you actually in the band oh yeah i had oh, a, that's good i it was like i spent 1300 dollars and jumped through hoops for about a year until what I got was a, called a certificate of rehabilitation, which says that I haven't even been on probation in the last five years. I haven't gotten in trouble at all. I'm a, I am a, um, I am a good component to society. I had to have people referencing me. I had to have because Jesus I was a musician. You know, oh, it was insane. Canada's really serious, bad. man. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I had a really bad. Th that wasn't the only time I've been to jail. <laughs> like I've had a, I, again, I was bipolar, man. I was very impulsive. I. I had a really interesting life, <laughs> but like, yeah, so I had a, I had a bad, you know, um, criminal record and everything that I had to clear up and shit. So I understand, but, uh, yeah, man, it was, uh, it was a trip, but yeah, we eventually went through there and it was awesome. It was, it was really good. Um, it was, we were well received. I, I wish we got to spend more time playing in Canada. What's your weirdest show? Think right uh, now the winner for us is an elementary school and they played to fifth graders. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so good. Oh, that's really I mean that that was the weirdest tour right there, right? Um uh I just gotta put shit together. Dude, I gotcha. Another one that we had was uh someone playing in an ice cream shop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um we played in a I mean, we played in a sub shop before, played in a laundromat. I mean, I, I kind of think that heavy, heavy, low, low show. I mean, it, it depends. What are we defining as weird? I got you. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, is, yeah. It, is it the, because um, both of those stories were really kind of fucking weird. Uh, trying to, oh, uh, we played in a, well, we once played in a basement and uh, people were like letting off in Ithaca and they're like letting fireworks off like crazy all over like in the was, basement like, was, Jesus Christ yeah <laughs> like it, they had like they had no we had no business being down there it wasn't good um, there we played uh, yeah I mean like yeah it might take me a minute to, Dude, you're to good, come you're up good, with that uh, we, we can move on um, so we have a question here we ask everybody how do you dress your hot dogs mustard relish onions diced onions Maybe not the, uh, maybe not the relish, sometimes, but <laughs> definitely mustard, definitely like diced up red onions. Okay, but you like uh, a little bit of tangy. But when, yeah, but when when I'm at my best, it's 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 a non dog of some sort. I try to be vegan whenever I possibly can be. Oh, I didn't know you were vegan. Mm -hmm. I, I at my best, I am. Like uh, I, I, I just through this, I did this big move, and sometimes um, some people do it better than others for sure. But like I, uh, I just went through like this big transitionary peak, like stage, and I wasn't staying at home. I didn't have my, my kitchen and like the routines down and everything. And um, so like you know, sometimes just out of necessity, it was like either starve or not, you know. So, um, I generally, 
I'm definitely like um, uh, a vegetarian. You know, it's just on occasion I'll be just like, I, I, what am I supposed to fucking do? You know, but I, I, I don't ever, I don't ever purchase any like, um, I, I, I shop vegan. But you know, if, if someone's like okay. giving me a, I'm, I'm not gonna. The only thing I, the only thing I that that really comes on comes into my diet regularly is I have whey protein. Back in the day, I purchased a number of whey protein, like whey protein, um, for a number of, of reasons. Um, you know, I'm not proud of it particularly, but it is what it is. So I'm not going to let it go to waste, you know, like where there is, there is absolutely like, uh, um, 51% of the vegan lifestyle for me is health. And then 49% being, um, you know, the, just the, Politics the moral, behind it. Re, the moral responsibility to uh, you know sentient creatures, but um, yeah, man, fucking uh, yeah. The, but the yeah, the whey protein. Long story short, I, I have that. I'm not gonna like throw it away. It's like you know, it's I don't see any value in me throwing it away for right. the sake of the nipple that's already been squeezed or whatever. <laughs> but you know, I, at the same time, you don't want to support the industry. You know, uh, but, yeah. Lee Fisher said that you have a Santa story. Um, I have plenty of stories of Lee running around butt ass naked. <laughs> Do any of them involve Santa? <laughs> uh, are you? Is he? Uh, do you have access to him? Is he talking about when I dressed up my balls like Santa Claus? Or is he? Talking, <laughs> or, is he or, or is he talking about eight ball Santa? I'm, I'm trying to so there's out multiple Santa, Santa like, stories. <laughs> oh, you know he he was a part of the fucking um, the Mortal Kombat story. Are you familiar with the the Mortal Kombat story? I am, I am, but there might be he some was, other he people was, that weren't. Um, I, I can, I'll tell it really quick. So we played in St. Louis, Missouri, and um, I'll, I'll keep it short. We got ripped off, or we, we didn't get our guarantee. And usually when you're like out in the Midwest, like where the drive is like five hours or more, um, you're at least hoping that you get the gas money. And like we had a guarantee of like two fifty that night, and we got like seventy five bucks. And I went to talk to like the the owner of the venue, and I just wanted to like you know I'm like maybe the overhead was weird. I don't know what's going on, but like we don't necessarily need. And there's contracts. He was all like legit contracts and shit. And like you know I, I don't know what was going on. I was just gonna go talk to him, you know, and just like hey, you know, if we had another fifty bucks, then that would cover the hundred and twenty five to get to the next city. And the promoter, or the the owner, was like, you know, six four, six five, big fucking dude. He had his hands fucking folded, didn't look at me once, just looked straight ahead the entire time. He said, <laughs> "Not my problem, not my problem." So Damn. I walk, I, I walk back, I walk. We had our at the time my um, our my my buddy from high school was our merch guy, and he he's just a scumbag like me. And we were like, we were standing in this like backstage area. And we we're like, God, man, that guy's a fucking dickhead. I mean, I it, we I, we were like, I wish we could do something about it, you know, to like, you know, get back at him. And we both looked over. It was like a movie. We both looked over and saw, and it it wasn't a part of the outer access of the bar. It was like like stored in this rehearsal or, or this stored in this like room where people would put their gear, waiting, you know, to, waiting to play or taking it off the stage. It was a Mortal Two arcade game, and me and Jeff looked over and saw it. And we didn't we didn't even say a fucking word to each other. We just started planning how we were gonna steal it. We knew it, like right then <laughs> and there. So we I pulled the van up in the back, left it on, cleared room in the trailer. But here's the thing, there's a moment where we have to lift it up and we have to carry it out the doorway, you know, there and that's a vulnerable moment, right? Right. So those things are heavy as shit too. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And what ended up happening was uh Okay, but there's like six security guards, right? And like, so all the other bands on the package had been ripped off too. So they were all on, the, they were, it wasn't hard to convince them to help us out, right? So what we did was we, 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 we did an inventory of every fucking uh, security guard and we had everyone was assigned to a different security guard. So they all went and they talked to because it was like the show was over. The bar was still open. There's people. But at this point, the security guards just stand there kind of picking their nose. Right. <laughs> so they uh, everyone went to the security guard and just started talking to them. And, you know, and slowly started turning the conversation. So they're looking the other way. And, and it was just like Ocean's Eleven. It was great. Right at the end, right before we're about to take it. You know, I knowing what was going on. Look there, they're talking to him. Look there, they're talking to him. Look there, they're talking to him. Like everyone's in on it. And we, and sure enough, Jeff and I picked it up. 
ran out, put the fucking uh, Mortal <laughs> Arcade thing into the trailer. While we're doing it, the fucking there's this homeless guy. That, first off, I don't think he has any more. But Kit from the um, Into the Moat was on that tour, and he videotaped this whole thing. He had really? his camera. Where yeah, and like oh shit, yeah, yeah. I I tried to like I haven't even. I think I talked to their drummer on uh, Matt on Facebook. I think once or twice I maybe brought it up. I doubt. I don't know how you could ever tape over that, but he was definitely videotaping it. And I'm like my adrenaline, like I hadn't been in, I, I was like sober, sober, sober. I've been like, so at this point I've been like sober. This was during a period I was sober for like 10 years. Right. So part of me being sober was not getting in trouble anymore. Like I just didn't, you know, I was just on the, I was on the straight and narrow. This is like one of the first times I did something that was horribly inappropriate. <laughs> so my adrenaline's fucking raging. And like, and you I'm realize like halfway this, through, what the fuck I should be doing? Well, well, no, there's this homeless guy that comes up. While I'm trying to put this in, like in, and he's like trying to ask me for like a pencil or a screwdriver. I'm just like, are you fucking kidding? Like my adrenaline's like popping out my pores, right? Like I'm like, get the fuck away from me. So we we end up leaving, and and, and uh, the details are interesting, but not so important. They end up we're we're staying at our 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 friend's house, and it's the moat. Um, they're staying there too. They had this big house and, uh, they're like, um, what are they, what do they say? They're, uh, they're like, Hey man, the police are outside. We're like, yeah, right. And they're like, no, they're outside. So we went up there and sure enough, they were there. And like, I'm used to like, I mean, I could have fought it anyways and it wouldn't matter. But like, at this point I'm used to trying to be accountable for my mistakes and shit. So like the, um, the cops are like, can we look in the trailer? I'm like, yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? They're going to get in here anyways. Fucking, it's not like you can hide it. So the at the time, there's the cops, the owner, and a bunch of the security guards. The security guards are all standing there, all tough with their hands, <laughs> like, folding and shit. And then when the cops and the owner of the venue, like, walk away to discuss how they're going to handle it, the security guards totally change their demeanor and they're like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened here before. That guy is such a fucking asshole. <laughs> so like they, they totally, they totally had our backs on it. I did like a, I did a day in, in St. Louis County and um, they didn't, they dropped the charges, you know, like I didn't have to, but I still had to get paperwork for that. Even though they dropped the charges, I had to find like, like small amounts of paperwork, you know, that just said that I even had job like charges dropped really? for the, for, for Canada. I had, they found everything. Yeah, they made sure I brought like every overdue library book home. Like they, they were on top of everything. So <laughs> that's crazy, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I, other, otherwise, I don't know what Santa Claus story he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the so Santa Claus story. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Vanna Dillinger from Facebook. She's in a, in a band called Nine Godly. She wanted me to say this. Okay. Uh, Chris, you're one of the first and biggest inspirations when discovering math music and just how much chaos could be delivered in a tasteful way. What was your first experience with this revelation and how much did it shape your playing? Also, will you listen to my band, Nine Godly? <laughs> okay. Um, I will listen to your band. Um, Nine Godly. I'll, I'll send, send you me a link. link. Send me a link to it. Um, and then uh, she said a lot of really nice things. Uh, yeah, she was and saying. And then she wanted me to. Was she asking? What was your first she experience wa- with? Uh, hold on. You're on the first. Okay, what was your first experience with uh, delivering chaos in a tasteful way? I guess. And how much did it shape your playing? That's a really good um, question. Now I read it out loud, but here we are. Okay, so <laughs> what was my first experience of someone else doing something crazy? in a tasteful way and then how did it shape my playing or how was how was oh my that might be experience? what she's trying to say yeah. yeah i kind of think that's what she's trying to say i, I think the first one kind of sounds like what was my first like okay yeah. well if if she, um if i'm answering it wrong i apologize <laughs> um let's see here chaos i mean i got like the first again, time that you like listen to something you're like what the fuck is this like lethargy lethargy really changed everything for me a lot they're a local band um the the guitarist um front man for lethargy um is like a a, a a rochester like uh staple rock hero eric burke um he played he he, he played guitar and sang in a band called slaco will tip and um uh, relapse records put out something the relapse ep is really fucking awesome like uh they're they're it's like a little tempered down lethargy 
a little more heavy than goofball-y, but they still, it's, it still has like the Eric uh, Burke vibe or whatever. Uh, Lethargy, this might make it a little more um, cerebrally tangible. Uh, Bill and Braun, the drummer and, and um, guitarist from Mastodon, were originally in Lethargy. Totally different band, though. Yeah, like, I was going to say, it's uh, freaking crazy, man. Yeah, like uh, Ma- Mastodon, um, it's like kind of like a stoner metal version of Lethargy. It basically, Braun's still playing like the stylistic, like overplaying drum stuff, a little more outside the box because he didn't have to try to stay within the like the 4-4, four, four, you know, general time that you would in like the stoner metal version of what um, Mastodon does. So with that, they, you know, they just did some really goofy shit. And up until that point, I had never heard anything like that. So that was like a huge turn on. Um, but I, I do, I do think it goes without saying that notable mention is calculating infinity. When calculating infinity came out, it changed everything. Everything got like just flipped, and it, it's still like it's been like twenty five years, give or take or whatever. And you know, there's different bands who different things. It's not like they're the only bands that were brutal, but I mean that album is still just untouchable. Right. I, don't, I can't believe how I can't believe how timeless that album is, especially in a genre where people are constantly pushing the envelope. Now, mind you, people push the envelope in the other way, like being more ugly, doing like the pig, you know, and like a low, you know, let's like twelve <laughs> string guitars, and yeah, and they and they are they're doing some really ugly shit. You know, a lot of what's going on in the underground scene is just like you know, delivering like this ugly product. The thing that's going on with calculating infinity, I once heard this analogy of it being like a New Jersey street fight. And it is, it's just, it's fucking violent. It's fucking violent, you know? And I don't, you know, I mean, Psyopus is violent and I'm sure there's other bands like that where there's just that pummeling, pummeling energy. Um, And there are other great bands that did that shit, but there's just something, especially like there, there are influences that, that, Dillinger had that you can tell, but like something happened with like right before I think they put that EP out like uh, along the along the running board or something, uh, and they from t- under the running board I think from under yeah, and then they that that like that really chaos thing came out, and then fucking yeah, calculating just did something that you know hasn't happened, and I and I they did they they've done you know cool stuff since, but just nothing touched it. It's like Led Zeppelin would never be able to put out another House of the Holy album. You know, you just, you just don't put it out again. You know, it's mm-hmm. just whatever. You're like, yeah, the, totally, man. The, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, there's some bands that are uh, kind of bringing the Dillinger vibes back, you know, like some bands trying to pick up the torch and stuff. Have you heard of the Callus sure. Dow Boys? I, I don't listen to anything. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on. Oh, and every okay. year, more and more albums. Come, yeah, like seriously, like my favorite band right now is this um, – this like gypsy band called the, uh, the Barcelona Gypsy Klezmer band. Like they literally are. They're all I've been listening to for like the That's last year and a half. I listen to Fanagram, Marvin Gaye, um, Indian again, Indian classical music up the wazoo. Like my my playlist is like all female sing and like Spotify is all female singers, flamenco music, tango music. It's just like I'm I'm just going there. So I feel it, it's weird. Like I, I was so so much of a part of the the metal scene and then when i do things like this people are like have you heard of and i feel like so inept i'm like i have no idea what's going on That's stop crazy. pointing it out <laughs> but no yeah so the, the callous cowboys what's that all about? the callous dow boys uh they're okay. just basically okay. a, a continuation yeah. of a dillinger escape plan cool yeah they're one of the the bigger bands in the scene right now um let's see here we're almost done with the questions, by the way. I just, you know, I don't want to make you, you know, use up too much of your time. Um, I'm unemployed. <laughs> F-S-O-J-T-O-M-C. I don't know how I'm supposed to say that. Uh, he says, my man, do you embrace pedals or do you see people using them specifically whammy pedal as a crutch? Say that again? Do you see people using pedals as a crutch? Like, is that a, do you, see, do you think that they're using that as a crutch? Do they rely on it too much? No, no. No, I think anyone can do whatever the fuck they want. Hell yeah, I'm with you, you on know? that. Yeah. I, I, like, uh, I remember, it, it, not like I'm this, like, all oh, wise dude, but, like, I remember I was, I, I did that, I was, I was speaking at a college, and someone asked me if, like, if uh, I thought that, um, you know, today's music didn't have as much feeling as music did before, and... You know, and 
when I think about that, like, you know, especially earlier in digital recording, you know, it's like everything kind of sounded sterile. You have like the, uh, the digital, like the digital silence versus just like the regular analog silence where you could literally, you know, if like, you know, Led Zeppelin or something was playing and everyone stopped, they wouldn't go in and edit that area out where everyone stopped and just completely, you know, like shut it out. So there's like nothing, no ambience, no reverb, no nothing. Then they started doing it, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's just these different things, but like at the same time, it's like, it's so subjective, you know, and it's it, the, the tools of the trade. I mean, the art's going to change. So the way I developed as a, as an artist and how I perceive stuff, not that I can't change, but I'm, I'm certainly going to be influenced by everything I, I grew up with. And like, so I could understand where certain modes of like expression or, uh, would be, um, wouldn't sink in exactly with how I see the world, but I, you know, I can't speak for you and how you perform your music. You know, I, the best example is, you know, like, um, I put a lot of thought and feeling into Psyopus. It was intense. I was bipolar. I was fucking ready to kill. Um, <laughs> but like so many times I, we would get the stereotypical, he's just playing fast guitar with nothing at it. You know, like that, that shred guitar has no feeling and stuff. And once I started getting, I started receiving criticism like that, it changed my whole entire perspective, like um, perspective on all, even like, you know, all the more generic prog guitars, like Michelangelo or Rusty Cooley or any, any of them, right? Like any of the, any of the people that would get criticized for just being shredders with no feeling and stuff like it made me like, you know, kind of stand back and recognize like, you know, people are going to express themselves however they are with whatever tools they have. And if the, what they're doing is what they're vibing doing, then, you know, that's, you should accept it that way, you know? And if, if they are going to discriminate or make distinctions between how they play and how they develop as a player and it makes it go in whatever direction, then that's them developing as an artist. If they don't care, that's how much they're not going to develop as an artist. Like, you know, you could say it as a joke, but you could also say like, that's the artist. They're, if they're into it, they are. And if they're not, they're not. Uh, but I mean, like, um, fucking Rage Against Machine, man, that like, like, I don't, at least in the circles I roll, I can't, I, I'm surprised how much their guitarist doesn't get more credit for how innovative he really fucking was, especially at the time. And he used the whammy pedal like fucking nuts, you know, and I don't think it was a crutch. It was just, wow, this is fun. This is exciting. This is a cool <laughs> idea. You know, I mean, again, because I'm not very familiar with what's going on in the scene, if if everyone or if there's like this like notable slice of the pie percentage of people doing the same thing with a whammy bar to the point where someone might say it's just a crutch well there that there might be some level of an observation saying that they're not very original or they're not you know they're not really offering anything different um which then they could say you know imitation is their crutch <laughs> you know like i i want to play i got nothing to say so my crutch is i'll just rip you off um and and, and you know and you could it depends like you know who what court are you judging that in if you're just you know if it's just in the the opinion of like um people going and hanging out and seeing a show like who gives a fuck if you're like trying to look for someone to start a band with you might want nothing to fucking do with them because that's not where you're going with your band so i don't know but <laughs> and also we always got we always got to be wary of the elitism you know that's it like what i would say hey you guys you douchebags with those whammy pedals fucking suck it up and become real musicians like people <laughs> who aren't using those whammy pedals uh so treebeard the awesome asked me to uh well we already talked about Subin, Subin Tree song. treebeard treebeard the awesome, the awesome. yeah yeah uh, yeah uh we, he, awesome. he's asking a question we already covered though um this one's even oh no we already talked about this pickups i think i might be running out of questions more duncan invaders <laughs> mm -hmm. uh Keith Carlson was wanting me to ask, have you heard of uh, Databots and what are your thoughts on their Psyopus album? Do you know what I'm talking about? Databots? Okay, so it's a project. It's an AI that writes music. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, okay, they, yeah. They, they tried it. Um, well, for, for everyone listening, it's an AI, they feed it uh, raw music, and it writes its own music in relation to that. So they gave it all of, uh, oh, ideas of reference, and it, sh it spit out 24 minutes, maybe, of an album, something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting. 
I, uh, I don't remember like being like overly impressed with it or whatever. Like, uh, I mean, it, it's cool. It's an experiment. I have to, like, I definitely want to applaud that. Um, but I think if I remember correctly, it just seemed like they just chopped it up into a million pieces and then That's randomly kind of threw it, it together. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a it little, a, like, overly distorted and stuff, too. I was listening yeah, to it today. Yeah. So, I mean, thanks for spending the time to do it. Right. <laughs> you know, right. like, cool. You know, that's cool. It's, it's, um, I, I, I appreciate that someone would even, you know, think to fuck with our material like that. You know, that's cool. Right. But, uh, you know, I like, I, uh, the I, you know, sometimes like when you're writing, you might have this like really cool abstract idea and then you bring it to the band and you're playing it and no one likes it. And then you try to win them over by explaining what you're trying to do. <laughs> and you got to remember like you actually listen to music, you know, it's not like you're going to be like in the title, in the, like in the, the notes of the fucking book, music book. It's like, you might not like two minutes and 30 seconds of the song, but let me explain you what we're doing. So maybe you do like listening to it. <laughs> like, like that doesn't happen. So it's like, I think it's a cool idea, but yeah, again, it just seemed like they just spliced a bunch of pieces together. So cool. You know, <laughs> I'm not, offen I'm not, I'm not offended, you know, I'm, so I'm, you're not I'm afraid honest. that the computers are coming for us. <laughs> I am not afraid of that. No. <laughs> uh, not in my lifetime. Ha have you ever considered writing on extended range guitars? Uh, extended range guitars, like uh, like longer registers. Is that? Uh, like, uh, I like think he might be meaning uh, like seven strings, strings and, and eight strings and stuff like that. I have, <clears throat> but and and uh, I mean, I did the the Burning Halo is the only time I ever worked with a different tuning than than standard tuning. I did this really weird tuning. It was like a B, F sharp, and B. So it was like a seven string, like a drop D style seven string on the low three strings. And then the top three were all B strings tuned B, C, and C sharp. So I could sweet pick um, the minor seconds with the, with the heart, like with the harmonics. So I go <laughs> like that weird, ugly sound. Um, so that was a lower register song. So that was like my attempt to do that. Here, here's the uh, the thing. Like, um, I think about it, and especially as I'm getting older, I don't want to be this like fuddy duddy who just doesn't do it. Like, you could see, like, yeah, why did those old like, old <laughs> bands not playing with really low tuning? Um, and I think, like, you know, as someone who you know keeps preaching, like, being creative, trying all these avenues, like, I recognize that as a resource of um, new dimension. You know, but like even when we played standard tuning, like it was in standard tuning, which is still exceptionally different than what everyone else is doing. Like usually everyone's at least dropped E or at least a half step down. I'm still playing E to E on my guitar. And the, the that just the makes it more intense to people listening to it, like knowing that you're just playing in standard tuning. Yeah, right. Like I just the the explanation has been that. I've just never had a problem coming up with ideas. <laughs> you know, like, I'm never like, no, I don't need that. No, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and I'm going to do this. You know, like I never, now that not to say that I couldn't be mindful enough to like do those ideas uh, because like one thing that is, it's very apparent. Um, I mean, I've come up with ideas how I can get around that with, with playing standard tuning, but um, there's no question that the zeitgeist of modern metal is um low register it, like to the point where it's like it, we've really got you it's heavy 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 fuck like that that is a very relevant question especially for a band who isn't doing that right now um so like i'm missing out on a certain level of aggression that could be utilized in this art form and you know, and, and some of it bothers me, but some of me, it's like, I'm just too lazy to go get a fucking eight string or nine string and try to fucking dick around. And again, I haven't been having that issue where like, I don't feel like I'm, you don't need when it. When I'm in the middle of, I don't, yeah, I don't feel like I'm left wanting, but part of me saying like, you know, like the ignorant old dude, like, you know what, man, like if you are artistically trying to express yourself in this genre of music, are you being stubborn to ignore the fact that right like are you missing part something of, are you missing are you, out? yeah like yeah like because really like you could be delivering some fucking haymakers man you know if i had like two lower strings um 
but yeah, I mean, like the, I, I mean, I'd be creative and work around it. You know, like obviously we're so fucking noty that some of the lower register stuff just wouldn't even, it would, there'd be no reason to go, you know, like it, like it would just be like, I mean, you could, like you'd have some kind of ripple, but there'd be no differentiation between this ripple and that ripple. If I'm playing like a million notes down there. Right. But then I would just, I would just do other shit. You know, I would just, well, th this is, this is the, these are the body parts of this guitar. How am I going to use them? I, okay. I don't think it works that way. What will we do? So that's when you seizure on your guitar and you come up with something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Start headbutting it. But yeah. Yeah. It's fucking, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, it's a, uh, it's a good question, and it is, it is something that I philosophically um, wrestle with when I approach thinking about metal. Like, for example, when I, I did, I wrote four songs for Phil and Samuel and like sixty riffs, and he didn't say anything to me, but like I, I had asked um, Lane from the Tony Danza Tap Dance Extravaganza if he would play second guitar in that project, and he told, and he was hanging out with Phil. And Phil said, like, yeah, he's got to learn how to fucking play with a lower, you know, lower tuning or whatever. Like, Phil never said that to me, but he told it to Lane. So, I mean, I don't think I'd miss out, you know, on doing that. Even if I, like, even if I just, like, tuned lower with a six-string guitar. The, again, remember I was saying I don't use pedals because I don't want to deal with having to have these, like, technical problems. Part of that is my approach, too. I don't want to have to deal with getting all these new guitars <laughs> and not being able to use these ones and, you know... But, yeah, it would be getting four a year instead of just the two, man. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right, fucking. So, uh, yeah. FSO JT OMC uh, again is asking how many riffs. I only have two more questions, by the way. Um, but how many riffs did you write specifically because they were difficult to play or obnoxious to listen to? Seven. <laughs> yes, I was hoping you were gonna say an exact number, but. <laughs> But no, I, I don't think you were trying to really do that. Were you like making something no. that's just stupid? Well, um, I mean, I'm sure I have, you know. Uh, like, wait till you get a load I, of this. <laughs> like, but, oh, yeah. Well, like, you, so, um, in the end, if it's if it sounds stupid, then it sounds stupid. <laughs> um, I do think that, like, it, you know, we talk about, like, developing the subjective experience of music. I obviously have a different relationship with Psyopus than anyone else does. Um, so what I what I think of is a a um, a perfectly sounding disjointed riff, you know, someone might think is dumb, you know, especially because like a lot of that theory is um, really approaching like the relative interval theory, especially is really approaching melody in a different way. And it's utilizing a lot of tension and, you know, just awkward intervals. And like, I remember the, the song X and Y has some like a really weird, it's really weird. And I remember, I haven't been able to find it, uh, but it was, they did put it up it, like one of those like guitar, guitar hero.com pages where it's just like, you know, people that are really, really into guitar or something they they came to a show backstage and like videotaped me doing a tutorial on how to play the beginning of x and y and afterwards like they put it up and i read it and someone um someone in the in, in the guitarist community said it sounded like one of those um you know what are those called when you shreds one of those shreds videos on youtube where they like pretend that the band's playing and someone's just playing really crappy music behind it <laughs> okay. Do you know what i'm talking about i, like, I, I don't like, know what you're saying but i can like, get the concept the, the everyone knows the one with ingve malmsteen like he's like i mean thanks malmsteen i'm so good like they're using his like instructional video and then what they'll do is like i'm ingve okay and then they'll so play good. shit over and it okay I got shit you. guitar right and they do it with like bands playing it like uh um, oh, there's like Creed has a great one. Hall and Oates has a good one. Uh, they're so fucking good. Um, <laughs> the Disturb has a great one. Yeah, you can you can go down the rabbit hole and not feel like you wasted any of your time <laughs> just looking up Shreds videos. But he said like it sounds like one of the Shreds videos, and like I totally get it. You know, like I, I, I I'm experimenting with like these like very distant like a lot of the the metal people that have a more traditional Eastern European or, or Western European um, sensibility for metal, you know, like the metal core would be like one response on the West coast, but you know, like uh, 
I don't know. I can't think of any of the names right now. Like, uh, uh, into what was it? Uh, flames, inflamed, in or flames, yeah, in flames, you know, like that kind of. So, yeah, yeah, that like that. They a lot of them don't like like Psyopis because they think that it's just like random bullshit notes or whatever. But like you get, we also have like you know, the U, the U.S. comes up with some weird shit like that. Like we had corn. We have a lot of other like crazy like just non tonal center conscious like bands coming up with just different ways of experimenting with music. So yeah, man, like uh some of it sounds that way and I would understand why people with that, but it's it's you know, I'm it's me there's always method to my madness. There, I have an idea behind everything. I dare you to find anything in my in my catalog where I wasn't like I could explain why I'm not doing what I'm doing. But yeah, for sure. Like I've definitely experimented with shit that might not be so ergonomic or that might be really like pushing the bounds of playing, um, you know, somewhat. I'll do it recognizing that it's kind of like a parlor trick. But usually there's there's theory going into it enough where I'm like, look, I'm doing this on the guitar. It sounds like this. So blah, blah, blah. Like except the the sweet picking thing in X and Y as well. It's just like crazy um, like – seven finger tapping sweet picking uh whole tone to diminish thing that's just like i can't play it right now i can't <laughs> fuck that i'll never play that song but it 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 created an effect and that you know as long as it's like archived on the recording you know like that song sounds like that if you like it cool i like it i think it's cool i think it's extreme so oh i think all your shit's awesome man so oh, sure. one last question cap off the whole thing the big whammy here. This one's also from Keith Carlson. Does pineapple belong on a pizza, a.k.a. Piopus? <laughs> yes. I have no problem with it. I think, God, I you're think weird. Can, yeah, I think, <laughs> nah. what, is, what, is it, what is it? Ham and pineapple? Usually? Uh, yeah, Canadian bacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, or yeah I've, I've had that before. I think it's good. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I, it's, it's like kind of like cilantro. It's like in your DNA. You either like it or it's just repulsive. So, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. Tomatoes and pineapple, it's not really, that's not my jam. I don't know. I don't know. There, there's something <laughs> about the tomato sauce that is so far removed from tomatoes, though. I don't like tomatoes generally okay. by themselves, but you know, like that, it's a pasty kind of thing with all sorts of spices. The texture is totally different. Um, it's like an you're accent. a vegetarian, but you can't stand tomatoes. Oh, well, uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, that just might be a thing, right? <laughs> um, like plum tomatoes, sometimes I like. Sometimes the like the the the, the tomatoes right off the vine. But this is what I find. Like I'll go shopping, and I'll get. Um, I often buy tomatoes that I don't eat. Kind of like buying bananas you don't eat. Like you buy them to just sit there and be like art on your table until it turns <laughs> brown, and then you throw it away. I try. I try. To, and there have definitely been eras in my life where I'm far more receptive to the. Um, the benefits of what a tomato can taste like, but sometimes I'm just like, why, why? I just eat it because it's supposed to be healthy. <laughs> all right, well, that's about all I had to talk about, man. Unless you had something else you wanted to bring up. No, uh, just um, if you're interested in guitar lessons from me, go to my Facebook page and talk to me about guitar lessons. Or if you are interested in any of my um, the theory, my my literature, and it ha I think it has transcriptions for three Siopa songs. You can go to explodingfingers.com. Highly and, recommend uh, the books, by the way. Highly recommend them. Super, super. Thank good you. Stuff. Yeah. So that yeah, the more I um, the more I can support myself that way, the more music I can write. So <laughs> there we go. There's the incentive. <laughs> uh, so there's no way that you listen to my podcast, you haven't checked out Siopas, but if you haven't, I guess check them out because uh, it's amazing. Um, you guys are on, Siopus is on Spotify and all the other streaming sites. It's weird though; I couldn't like put it on a story on my Instagram, so I don't know if there's something missing right, missing there. But I found you all on Spotify oh. and everything. Um, you also have the Exploding Fingers uh, Dojo. We've had the uh, URL uh, underneath your video this whole time um, at explodingfingers.com. Uh, and then you give lessons. And as far as social media goes, you're, j you're just on Facebook, right? You're not on, like, Instagram and stuff. Yeah, like, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter and I don't ever go on them. Like, I try to fit in and then I I think I just I, – I pass that age threshold where I just don't give a fuck. <laughs> if, if you I really want to treat, go check out the the Facebook for Psyopus. You don't even have a picture uploaded or anything. He's got one post right. saying, hey, guys, we don't know how to use Facebook, but we're here. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that there is. And you have 7,000 followers. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> that's crazy. Oh, that's uh, great. 
As for me, drop my channel, follow so you always know when I go live. You can also sub to get access to the interviews before they hit YouTube and the streaming sites. You also get ex access to these exclusive emotes. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. YouTube folks, if you like the video, please drop a like, tickle the notification bell, don't forget to subscribe. It's a great way to support me for free. Check out my music, The Sound That Ends Creation, at thesoundthatendscreation.bandcamp.com. My next guest is immigrant core band, Shepang. I think I'm saying that right. I hope I'm saying that right. It might be Chipang. I'm not really sure. Join us this Wednesday the 3rd at 7 p.m. Central right here at twitch.tv slash Creation for the live cast. Thanks for being here, Chris. Hope you had a good time. Thank you. I did have a great time. That was a three-hour interview. Dude, yeah. I was going to say you are Holy a shit. freaking trooper, man. Thank you so much for being <laughs> here. Uh, no and problem. thank you guys for watching and listening.